are going to move on the next session. Dr. Ashok, Ashish, yeah, yes. Next session, uh, again on the interventions, and I invite our moderator, uh, Dr. Professor UC Samal, Dr. Sandeep Kumar, Dr. Nirav Kumar, Dr. Ashish Shina, Dr. A.K. Jha, Dr. Ashok Kumar. And with pa panel and chairpersons, we are having B.C. Jha from Patna, Virender Kumar from Bhagalpur, Anup Singh, Rajiv Krishna, Pavan Singh, Rohit Kumar, and Shushant Pathak. So I hand over mic to them to start the session. So we'd like to start our uh, next session on, uh, and the first topic is endovascular neuro intervention in ischemic and hemodiazic stroke. And the speaker is Dr. Rahul Kumar. Uh, I would like to request Dr. B.C. Jhasar to introduce Dr. Rahul Kumar. Dr. B.C. Jhasar is there. So uh, can I have, uh, I think Dr. B.C. Jhasar is not there. Can I have Dr. Rahul Kumar? Uh, can you start your presentation, Dr. Rahul? Uh, yes, yes, please, I'm ready. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, at the onset, uh, my thanks to the organizers of this conference for giving me an opportunity to share what we have been doing in uh, acute stroke in the last uh, few years in Patna. Uh, my talk is to uh, basically discuss the endovascular interventions that are happening uh, in patients with acute stroke. And this is a field uh, that has been developing very, very fast, uh, very rapidly, and we have made a lot of progress. Basically, what I would like to start off by saying is, whenever we talk about stroke, uh, we talk about two very distinct conditions. We talk about ischemic strokes and we talk about hemorrhagic strokes. Now, as all of us know, ischemic strokes are the majority. They account for around 85% of cases. And uh, hemorrhagic strokes make up the remaining 15%. Hemorrhagic strokes are basically those strokes which happen because of aneurysmal ruptures, AVM bleeds, and so on and so forth. Uh, since it is a relatively smaller part and since it is a part which has matured over the last decade, uh, we will not be touching much about the hemorrhagic part. We will be talking mainly about the ischemic strokes that happen, which account for 85% of all acute strokes. Basically, whenever we talk about stroke, we need to understand that strokes can happen in ischemic strokes can happen uh, by one of three mechanisms. Uh, the most common mechanism out of the 85% of cases who present with stroke is an embolism. Uh, the embolism basically means that the clot develops somewhere else, most often in the heart, uh, sometimes in the arch, and sometimes in the carotid. And from there, it detaches and moves up and blocks one of the arteries of the brain, uh, causing ischemia of that particular territory. In the Indian scenario, and especially more so in Bihar and in the sub-Himalayan belt, uh, we have been observing that a lot of patients do not present with uh, cardioembolic stroke, rather they have uh, in situ disease of the cerebral vasculature, like atherothrombosis, what we call as ICAD or intracranial atherosclerotic disease. And that also creates a major problem for us when we are trying to re revascularize these patients. A very small minority of these patients are neither due to embolism nor due to atherothrombosis. They are because of inflammation uh, of the vessel wall, for example, vasculitis and vasculitis like syndromes, uh, which becomes especially important in the present era when we are talking about post COVID cases of stroke. Before we talk about interventions in acute stroke, I would just like to uh, point out the differences between extracranial arteries and intracranial arteries, because this is the most important factor which uh, allows us to choose one modality of treatment over the other. What we have to realize is. Uh, the intracranial arteries are uh, swimming in the CSF. They are in cisterns. They are not anchored to any structure like the myocardial arteries or like the epicardial arteries and the coronaries. Also, uh, they are much thinner in thickness. The walls are much thinner, making them much more delicate and much more prone to rupture. The amount of elastin in the media is very less. The smooth muscle cells are much lesser when compared to any peripheral artery and they have a complete absence of the external elastic lamina. So a lot of interventions which can be done for extracranial arteries cannot be done, cannot be practiced uh, in the same way in the intracranial arteries. Having said that, uh, let us see how exactly we treat these patients. 2015 was a year in which most of the large trials came out that proved that mechanical thrombectomy 
for an acute intracranial occlusion saves lives and it became a class one indication. Why I'm showing you all these clots is, these are the kind of clots that we extract from the brain of patients of ischemic stroke on a daily basis. Now, these are huge clots. These clots sometimes measure up to five to six centimeters in size. So what you have to realize is, if we do not do mechanical reperfusion in patients with intracranial large vessel occlusions, the chances that these clots are going to open up uh, with uh, uh, just thrombolysis, IV thrombolysis are next to zero. So having said that, now we have established that mechanical thrombectomy is a very, very efficient tool uh, in treating these patients. Let me show you some cases and we'll uh, take up uh, the issues one by one. The two basic techniques that are available to us as of today for reperfusing brain vessels. Now this is uh, an image which is showing you uh, the lower part here on the bottom in blue uh, is the internal carotid artery. On the top, you have the carotid bifurcation, the anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery. Let us say you have an occlusion of the distal middle cerebral artery. Uh, the first technique and the most commonly used technique is the technique of the stent retriever in which we pass a stent retriever through the thrombus, go distally, deploy the device. It is like a mesh. Then this mesh traps the clot within itself. Then we push the guiding catheter up. Now we have large intracranial support systems, which can be pushed up as far as the distal MCA. We push this whole thing over the clot, and then we retrieve the whole system as a, as a one piece. Uh, and on at the same time as the aspiration is going on, as the suction is going on, we keep a negative pull on the guiding catheter so that we do not have any distal fragmentation and distal dislodgement of the clot. This works very well when the clots are small, well-formed, and mostly embolic. Sometimes you have situations in which the entire artery from the bottom, that is from the carotid up to the intracranial level, is blocked. In that case, these stent retrievers are not very effective, so we change the technique. And here we use what is called as an aspiration technique, in which we take a large bore catheter. This is typically a six French-like system with a 070 inner diameter that can be taken up over a wire to the proximal end of the clot. It engages the clot, and then the whole clot can be sucked out. So these are two basic techniques that are being used as of today to retrieve clots from the intracranial circulation. Uh, we use them either in isolation or in combination. And depending on the kind of reperfusion we get, we either stop with one or we combine the two. An example of a case, this was a patient who uh, was a 60-year-old male. He had come with a sudden onset of right hemiparesis. Uh, the patient had aphasia. Uh, when we uh, did the MR, we found that it was a MCA occlusion. Uh, this was a patient of rheumatic heart disease, had atrial fibrillation. We took the patient up for thrombectomy. This is, as you see on the bottom, this is a microcatheter which has crossed the clot. Once we cross the clot, this process is blind. So we have to make an injection. We have to see that we are in the true lumen. We are not in a false flap. Uh, once this particular uh, artery is seen distally, we know that we are in the right place. And then the stent retriever is deployed through the microcatheter and the clot is extracted. When clots are very small, when clots are embolic, when clots are uh, very uh, well formed and dense, this technique works very well. And most often in a single pass, the entire vessel is opened up. Somehow, most of the patients that come to us are not uh, having clots that are this great, are not having clots that respond so easily to treatment. For example, this is yet another patient who's in the late 60s. He had again come with a left-sided uh, 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 ischemic uh, event. And when we did the MR, we found that the entire left side, the entire common carotid artery and the internal carotid artery was not filling. When we do the MR, we find that there's a large perfusion deficit in the entire hemisphere. We take the patient up for thrombectomy. We find that from the ICA bulb onwards, the whole thing is completely occluded. So this is a situation in which you don't know what is the situation above. You don't know what is the situation of the ICA terminus or of the MCA or of the ICA. So you have to start the treatment right from here. So this is a patient who typically behaves very well with the aspiration technique. And when we did the procedure, we pulled out the clot, which was almost five to six centimeters long. Uh, this clot was in the form of a cast of the entire left internal carotid artery. Once this was opened, the entire vessel opened up and the patient recovered quite well without a very large deficits. Not all clots that go up into the brain and cause problems are large clots. 
For example, we found that this was a patient who had presented with uh, recurrent episodes of TIA. This patient was having very small infarcts, micro infarcts in the brain. Uh, these patients, this patient was recovering spontaneously. But when we did the angiogram, we found that this patient had a very tight carotid stenosis, and this carotid stenosis was sending out small showers of emboli from here. So this patient underwent a filter placement in the internal carotid artery. Filter was placed distally to protect and to capture any debris which might have gone off from here during the intervention. The entire vessel was dilated, vessel was opened, and this filter was in position to catch any of the clots that went up, and the patient made a very good improvement, a very good recovery. Sometimes just thrombect uh, thrombectomy or thromboaspiration does not help. For example, this was again a patient with a left MC occlusion. You find that the distal left MC is completely occluded. We opened this with a solitaire with a stent retriever device. We did this thrice. We did three passes of solitaire, but each and every time uh, this patient used to open and then re-occlude, open and then re-occlude. And when we looked at the angiogram, we found that this patient had an intracranial atherosclerotic disease, which was not letting the vessel stay open. These are situations in which just a stent retriever or aspiration will not work. So we went ahead, did a balloon angioplasty. And after the balloon angioplasty, just a simple plain balloon angioplasty, the vessel stayed open and this patient did well. Similarly, yet another case in which there was a near total subtotal occlusion of the MCA patient had come with a stroke. Again, just a simple balloon angioplasty was done. And this patient also did well just with a simple balloon angioplasty. There will be certain situations in which stent retriever alone will not work, aspiration will not work, and just a balloon angioplasty will not work. For example, this is a patient with a cavernous segment stenosis of the ICA. Uh, we did the thrombectomy, opened the vessel up, but this was occluding again and again. Now, the problem with this area is that this area is on a 180 degree bend. So if you leave this area as it is just with a balloon angioplasty, there are a lot of eddy currents that get formed here due to the tortuosity of the vessel, and this vessel is going to close. So this, in this case, we had to deploy a stent in the entire cavernous segment. The cavernous segment being as tortuous as it is, is not amenable to a balloon mounted stent. So what we did is we deployed a self-expanding stent, the so-called wingspan stent, and the vessel stayed open after that. Once the, this is yet another case in which you found a tight stenosis in the cavernous segment, stent was deployed. Uh, we now have the ability to do a CT scan and a cone beam CT with vaso CT on the table itself, which shows the stent struts opposed very nicely to the entire vessel. This is essential because in case the stent struts are not opposed well to the vessel, you can have microemboli going up from here later as well. Uh, sometimes when you have tight stenosis in the middle cerebral artery, in that case, again, if a plain balloon angioplasty does not work, uh, balloon angioplasty was done. Uh, still, the vessel was closing. It was trying to close again and again, even after getting it opened up. So in these are the situations in which we have to deploy a stent in the distal vasculature. When the relatively straight segment of vessel is diseased, and this is the artery which has to be treated, these are cases in which we use typical coronary balloon mounted stents. And we have a lot of experience and we have felt that uh, uh, one of the stents like Endeavor from Medtronic is the one which tracks best, uh, which is the most supple and an over the wire deployment is done. And this vessel is completely opened. We now have the capability to do a CT scan immediately after the thrombectomy. The problem is not just opening the vessel. Once you open the vessel, then you set into motion a cascade of events, which sometimes end up in a hemorrhage. So the moment we finish the thrombectomy, we do a CT scan on the table itself, and we find various patterns of contrast staining. These are not hemorrhages in the brain. These are contrast staining patterns in the brain. And these contrast staining patterns in the brain ultimately tell us what is the pattern of blood brain barrier disruption. And we uh, are able to tell whether this patient is going to develop a hemorrhage later on or not. So just doing an angioplasty and a stent is not enough. We have to keep a watch. We have to see if this patient is going to bleed so that the subsequent care of this patient can be taken. And this technology itself is available to us in the cath lab. We now feel that it is basically because of the blood brain barrier getting breached uh, in periods of long segments of ischemia that the hemorrhagic transformation of the infarct takes place. But uh, uh, I'm not going to go into this as this is uh, uh, not, not in the scope of the discussion. 
one more interesting thing that we have started observing is uh, we look at the venous system also in patients of uh, stroke in patients of ischemic stroke and what we have found is in patients before reperfusion before mechanical thrombectomy if they already have thrombuses sitting in the venous outflow of that particular area you just have to imagine that the middle cerebral artery is completely occluded now this patient has come to us with for an intervention and we find that the venous outflow of the area which the middle cerebral artery was supposed to supply is also occluded then if we just open the artery this patient is not going to benefit because the blood has nowhere to go and ultimately it will result in a huge hemorrhage. So let me just show you an example of what happened. Uh, this was a patient who had come to us in the window period for thrombectomy. He had a large infarct in the middle cerebral artery territory. He had a completely absent uh, left middle cerebral artery, but we refused thrombectomy in this patient. When we refused thrombectomy in this patient, uh, people asked us why we refused and next day, at the end of 12 hours, without giving any thrombolysis or without doing any thrombectomy, this patient had bled. So we explained to them that this is because this patient's venous outflow was already occluded. And we have no technique as of now by which we can improve this venous outflow. So in this patient, if you reperfuse the entire middle cerebral artery territory, he's just going to bleed. So if you want to have a good prognosis in patients who undergo mechanical thrombectomy, you have to look at these factors as well before you decide on a course of treatment. When we choose patients appropriately and when things go according to plan, there is a near total reversal of the ischemia within 24 to 48 hours and the patients do very well. Having talked a lot about arterial thrombosis, we now have to just spend a couple of minutes on venous thrombosis. Uh, it is something which is not diagnosed very easily. Sometimes patients, for example, patients who are severely dehydrated or patients who have hyperhomocysteinemia, they come to us with a neurological syndrome which is not responding to routine medical management. And when we do the angiogram, we find that the entire venous outflow is blocked. In these patients, we take a microcatheter up into the superior sagittal sinus, do a thrombectomy, leave the microcatheter there, infuse urokinase for a period of 10 to 12 hours, and at the end of 10 to 12 hours, this entire sinus, which was occluded, uh, uh, which you can see on the left side, has now opened up, as you can see on the right side of your, of your plane. This is a perfusion map that we do on the cath table itself. The perfusion map shows us that just a two-second improvement in the cerebral blood flow is enough to bring the patient out of the coma from a GCS of 5 to a GCS of 13. This is all what is necessary. And when you do an angiogram of this patient on the next day morning, you find that the entire sinus has opened up. Just to summarize whatever I have said till now, mechanical thrombectomy is a very powerful tool that has been given to us in our hands for the last five to six years. And we have now realized, we have now data that for you to improve uh, one patient, you, you to put one patient back to normalcy, you just need to treat four patients as long as they come within 90 minutes. As the time progresses, obviously the number of patients needed to treat to give a better outcome increases. Uh, just to compare it with other disorders, for example, in bariatric surgery, the number needed to treat to improve one is 80. Uh, defibrillation of ventricular fibrillation is around four. But mechanical thrombectomy for stroke, the NNT is 2.5 to 3. That is a massive effect. And uh, that is something that we, we need to, to aim for. Uh, we also anticipate that in the next couple of uh, years, the, the, the advancements in the endovascular treatment for stroke are going to continue. Right now, we are at this level. We are at a plumbing job. When, when an artery is occluded, we just open it. But we believe that we will be having the ability to enhance the collaterals and how the collaterals can improve and how the collaterals can perfuse. Now, please, the, 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 now. Yes, this is the last slide. Uh, uh, how, how we can exactly improve the collaterals to, to perfuse the brain naturally without opening these vessels. Uh, conclusion, stroke is treatable. Multimodality approach to decision making is necessary. You need to have CT, CAT and MR all in the same center. We also need to look at the venous system. Don't miss out venous thrombosis. Number need to treat is three, and ICAD is the Achilles heel. In India, especially in Bihar, in the sub-Himalayan areas, ICAD incidence is 50%. So this is the place where we are having some difficulties. Thanks a lot for your patient listening, and I rest my case.
right here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rahul, for very elaborate and very good uh, talk on intervention in uh, logical so, I would ask uh, Dr. Anup to introduce Ajay sir for his next question. Now, next topic is bundle of each patient. Uh, it is the future of the patient, and uh, lecture will be celebrated by Dr. Ajay Sina sir. No need for introduction. He is a senior cardiologist practicing in Patna. Now, sir, So, I'm visible and audible. Yeah. I hope so. Uh, Dr. Jha and uh, Dr. Ashok. Uh, Uh, so, it said that nothing is better than Mother Nature. We know that. And uh, this is true. Everybody wants shopping. Everybody is looking for an organic product. So, you know, like, uh, like this, you know, the concept of bundle of his pacing came with after 50 years of normal pacing. And uh, so basically, uh, this is something like this is a typical pictorial uh, demonstration of normally 50 years we have been doing this lead at the right ventricular apex. But now, the last two decades, I would say that lead, uh, bundle of his pacing is now coming up, although not very much, you know, we don't have a lot of uh, data which are randomized, smaller data we have. So let me begin with a, you know, like case, which I got this morning, Dr. Mithilesh Das sent me this case. And this is a 28 year old female presented with DGS spells and three episodes of syncope for the last three weeks. And ECG showed sinus bradycardia as low as 36 beat per minute and treadmill showed maximum heart rate 85 minute per minute. Echo was normal. On the close questioning 11 year old son had mitochondrial myopathy. And so myocardial biopsy showed abnormal mitochondria, EPS, normal AV and conduction and his perkinji function. Now, this uh, lady was given a his pacing and you can see that after this his pacing, there's a, a, a lead in the RA as well as there's a lead in which is pacing the his and uh, Post-implant ECG was very good. And if you blow up, you see that uh, this is a classical, his bundle pacing was done and she did very well. So this was, in fact, he spoke to me that, you know, you must give this case to, he, in fact, he sent several cases to me. I remember when we were uh, in Paris hospital, we had, uh, we were just trying to grope in, in a patient uh, Narendra was there, who is now in UK. Narendra and me, we were doing. So we are not able to find out the correct threshold at the apex or anywhere at the base, at the floor. So what we did was, we just tried a place in the septum, higher in the septum, 
and screwed. And then the result was spectacular. So that was the beginning of my learning about, you know, septal pacing or, uh, so my agenda would be a uh, uh, little timeline and evaluation and this electrocardiogram and physiology, clinical evidences, hardwares and basics of learning how to do it and uh, some of the examples. So this was the first uh, bundle of his pacing in 1958, an animal model. And then 1959, the first human experience with bundle of his pacing. And that was the beginning of uh, electrophysiology also. A lot of cardiology started with a lot of electrophysiology. And this is the first uh, demonstration of uh, bundle of his pacing by Deshmukh. He was the pioneer man, he, and he, this is the case which is cited everywhere. And you can, uh, uh, after that, you know, we had several studies came in, and uh, we know the detrimental effect of RV pacing. And we know that if you pace RV more than 40%, the incidence of you know, LV dysfunction is around 20%. So this is, uh, there are two studies I'm quoting, mode selection trial and David, both of them have shown that heart failure, hospitalization and death was 2.2 to 3 higher in cases who were paced more than 40%. And this is the David trial and the most trial then people, the researcher, the doctors, the cardiologists, they started looking for an alternate site pacing. And uh, whether this alternate site pacing should be, you know, like RVOT or it can be mid septum or lower septum. And then there came the idea of his bundle pacing because this is the only effective way to. Uh, have electrical conduction across the, uh, down the Purkinje fibers and both the ventricles will be stimulated simultaneously. So both AV and VS, BV synchrony can be maintained at the same time. Several studies have shown the advantage of EP, uh, 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 bundle of his pacing. And you see that there is a very good trial of 38 patients which was a crossover trial, randomized crossover trial, which showed that from right ventricle to his pacing, the LV improves. Now, so what we see is long-term disadvantage of RV pacing is very well known to all of us. And ongoing trials and studies have shown that pacing site in the ventricle on the septum at the bundle of his can be of great value, but then we don't have a larger trial. And again, in CRT with Y ventricular pacing, I think uh, majority of people in Patna must be doing it. So even then we have one third who are non-responders. And even if they are responders, the issue is different. So sometime, you know, the higher threshold because from one side you are doing epicardial pacing, from other side you are doing endocardial pacing. So a lot of issues are there. Now, anatomy of uh, his, it is about 20 millimeter long and four millimeter wide structure. And the conduction is quite fast. And it runs in the inferior portion of membranous interventricular septum and continues along the left side of the crest of muscular interventricular septum. So, uh, and the electrocardiogram, intracavitary electrocardiogram is like this, and uh, which we are all familiar with. Uh, now, how this can be that bundle, this bundle pacing can correct bundle branch uh, block? Because this is a very important uh, diagrammatic representation, which shows that that the fibers for the left bundle and right bundle, both are predestined from the proximal part. So if you have a block, if you pace distally, you are able to restore the conduction in the bundle. And this is all about the, you know, more than 80% or around 80% uh, 
the the bundle uh, the the electrical conduction can be restored now there are three types of his bundle anatomically and so you know we have to understand that type 1 which is just below the uh, membranous septum you know you can have a picture like this selective his bundle pacing at a low output and then if you have a type 2 his bundle then you can have a pacing like this rv myocardial tissue captured at a low output and uh, you know your type 3 bundle you know you can have non selective his bundle pacing at higher output so what is it the bundle of pacing is a very simple concept stimulation of bundle of his causes activation down the his perkinji system and both the ventricles now several uh, researchers have done several studies in almost all the caveats and you know like starting from second third degree heart block to ab nodal ablation you know the concept of ablate and pace everybody has tried uh, everybody uh, has tried the, the concept of his pacing now the the, the guidelines 2018 acc aha and hrs guidelines they have also clearly mentioned that there is a place for a bundle of his pacing and uh, you know i told you that ablate and pace is a concept which is there in tachycardiomyopathy and uh, but all that glitters is not gold so all the benefits are not always there there, there are some risk also higher threats to seven percent and uh, and uh, ventricular under sensing is possible far field atrial over sensing is possible atrial capture is possible so now let's come to the basics of what is selective bundle of his pacing and what is non-selective selective is when stimulus to ventricular activation is equal to intrinsic hv interval and so paced qrs morphology is identical to intrinsic qrs and in there you can see this is classical selective his bundle pacing and there is an isoelectric interval here and if you see this uh, uh, the HV and the stimulus V interval, both are same. This is classical of selective HVP pacing. And then if you, so normalization of QRS is very important. Non-selective is what? It captures the local myocardium and his bundle connective tissue. And that is why you have pseudo delta wave there. So this is classical non-selective his bundle pacing. Now you see uh, in one graph there is a non-selective his bundle pacing and selective his bundle pacing. When you decrease the voltage, it becomes a selective pacing. Now let's come to the procedure uh, uh, in a very short uh, uh, for, form. You know, like. You know, you have a classical 3830 MRI compatible lead made by Medtronic, which is used in this. Uh, and then you have, uh, this is the classical lead. And then you have seats. There are various seats, but the C315, this delivery catheter is now being used in most of the people are using this. And uh, uh, the first, uh, of course, the first uh, uh, his bundle pacing was done with uh, this uh, catheter mapping, but now it is not required. And these are the various uh, gadgets which is required. And you have to have a, a pacemaker system analyzer and then 12 leading lead, uh, uh, recording system. And then uh, all these uh, hardwares are there. Seven French, seven French catheter sheet is enough. And uh, so access, as happens in pacemaker, access to the uh, cephalic, and then this is the classical. You 
see the unipolar uh, recording and then you once you have a good hiss you have found a very good hiss then you start pacing at 5 volt at the rate of 1 millisecond and then you see uh, this is very good pacing and this is uh, so check pacing check all the parameters and and then again check that you are right and then you give some leeway for, for the test the lead stability about 5 to 10 cm as you saw uh, saw in that dr mithilesh das uh, slide that it was it was you know like rounded like this and uh, again you test the uh, bundle location and the, all the parameters and then you are done and slid the catheter back out so this is uh, what we are talking about selective and non selective pacing there are some tips about the implants so i'll quickly run through because you know i have got only 3 minutes time uh, yeah. this is the, the selective pacing uh, where you know after blowing up you can see that there is a there is a gap and what is important yeah. is that the importance of ors and t wave is there and then stimulation to v versus stimulation to ventricular interval both are equal so uh, coming to the non selective which captures the hessian tissue as well as local myocardium and here the interval between pacing spike and qrs less than the baseline hv interval but ultimately i will come to that slide recently come there is no difference in non selective versus selective as far as this is non selective pacing and uh, so this is what, how we mapped and then this is how pacing was done and uh, you know validating with ecg sometime you know you can get a w like which gradually becomes and we also look at the impedance that's very important because sudden fall of impedance may indicate that we are in lv across the septum and this is example another example of uh, pacing you can see how uh, the qrs is narrowed and now left bundle branch pacing is another issue which has come up now and it is becoming more popular chinese have done lot of work and now crt along with left bundle pacing or uh, his pacing is becoming popular and uh, another example left bundle branch pacing is a best approach a uh, best possibly physiological pacing people say and then uh, there's latest you know a study which came like his sync study which showed that uh, the his crt is no inferior is non inferior to biventricular pacing again 80 year old lady who was given this the threshold increased but stabilized at 6 month time so you know the story of this thing i have quoted some editorial that successful hbp implantation is fraught with trouble sitting issue in, in the follow up during the follow up hbp leads typically so a low r wave that may result in over sensing of atrial and his signal and under sensing of ventricular signal so high his bundle pacing captured the sold is is sometime is a problem and it leads to battery depletion so thank you very much i thank everyone and my mentors like dr narsiman even dilip kumar from uh, who is going to speak on some he has come some topic aditya kapoor mithilesh das and the whole metronic team thank you very much any question i would love to answer uh, thank you dr ajay sinha sir for your wonderful deliberation on his bundle pacing we will discuss in questions later on with the advent of lbb pacing now i would like to uh, invite dr bc jha sir to introduce dr kv anand for next talk dr bc jha sir is there
this is sir is there first unmute sir hello yeah, um, yeah. i welcome dr <coughs> anand to uh, begin a talk on uh, renal artery uh, transplant blockage diagnosis and treatment uh, thank you uh, and uh, uh, good afternoon from uh, kerala uh, I, I hope my slides are visible. Uh, if any uh, uh, issues with my uh, audio or video, please uh, 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 please interrupt me in between. Thank you. And I thank uh, uh, CSI Bihar chapter for uh, inviting me for this August audience. And I thank uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. B.B. Bharati, uh, for uh, especially inviting me. Uh, so today, uh, in the next 15 minutes, I'll uh, briefly discuss about this particular topic, which I think many of you might have seen and tackled, and uh, uh, we will be seeing more and more cases in the future. That is transplant renal artery stenosis. Uh, how to approach? Uh, we have a large uh, cohort because ours is, a, a, is one of the biggest transplant centers in the state. Why uh, transplant artery stenosis is important? Because, uh, you know, the, the just a, a couple of slides on statistics in USA, which is uh, uh, there are about more than one lakh people waiting for transplant. And USA and China does the maximum number of transplant, about 15 to 17,000 per year. 70% is cadaver. In India, uh, we need about uh, 150,000 transplants every year. But unfortunately, we are doing only about 8,000. The latest statistics available on 2018 says around 7,900 transplants in India every year. And this is the data of 2018. And uh, if you see the transplants per million population, India is way down. It's, you can see in the left bottom corner, transplants per million is less than five. And uh, but uh, this is mainly because there's a huge dearth of cadaver transplant. Uh, of the total transplant, only 95% are live donor, and only 5% cadaver happening in India. Uh, so you can see India is the second largest number of live donor transplant. If you see the statistics, we does the second largest number of uh, live donor transplant because our cadaver program is uh, not very robust. So transplant renal artery stenosis is, a, a, is not an uncommon problem. It is... Uh, uh, the incidence, uh, it is uh, basically it's defined as renal artery stenosis leading to deterioration of renal functions and hypertension. Post uh, transplant, there are many reasons for uh, renal transplant and uh, including acute tubular necrosis, infection, etc. TRAS is TRIS, transplant renal artery stenosis, one of the important thing. The incidence is about 2 to 10 percent, depending on uh, uh, the definition and uh, the series. Usually, uh, in very, very, very experienced centers, the uh, incidence uh, usually reduces over the period of years. The management is very, very clear. It is not medical management, it is not surgery, and it is always treated with an angioplasty with a stent wherever possible. The surgical and medical options are very, very limited in this indication. And I will uh, say in the last uh, 17 years, 16 years, we had uh, nearly 1,200 renal transplantation. And uh, uh, the, it is trans is classified into early that is within six months and uh, late that is after six months 80 percent of the cases happen in first two years most the more than 50 percent happen in the first six months so most are early transplant renal artery stenosis the early ones are usually related to surgery uh, due to vessel trauma dissection uh, harvesting anastomosis issues and ischemic injury to vessel as well as kinking of the kinking of the arteries but late trans is usually because of progression of the other sclerosis or uh, it can be a part of chronic rejection and cyclosporin also can cause uh, artery endothelial uh, injury and issues. Another issue in post renal transplant is the renal artery thrombosis, which sometimes happens if there is a, a prolonged hypotension, dehydration, and acute tubular necrosis. So uh, before going into the management, we should know about the sites of transplant. Uh, you can see first transplant is usually done in the right side. And second transplant usually done in the left iliac fossa. And the third and the further transplant, uh, you have, it may be done either in right or in life. 
after uh, graft nephrectomy. So we should understand which uh, area is the transplant kidney. And uh, the, if it is to an external iliac artery, it's usually an end to side anastomosis. And if it, is a inter, if it is to the internal iliac artery, it is usually an end to end anastomosis. Many surgeons uh, from different schools uh, practice differently. Some are ex more experienced in end to side in the external iliac, some uh, practice end to end in the, in the internal iliac. Sometimes uh, the procedure is not that simple. There will be multiple renal arteries in the uh, in the cadaver, in the donor, so you have to have multiple uh, way, modification of the technique. If there is multiple renal artery with uh, complex anastomosis, it doesn't uh, affect the early trans, but the late trans is more common if there is multiple renal artery donors and uh, uh, donor artery and uh, uh, complex anastomosis. The trans incidence is lowest in cadaver because in cadaver you can take a patch of the aorta also. And if the patch of the aorta is anastomosed to an external iliac artery or internal iliac artery, that has the lowest incidence. So in cadaver donor uh, patients, they have a 50% less incidence of trans. But end to, uh, again, within end-to-end uh, -end versus end-to-side, end-to-side has a less incidence compared to end-to-end -end anastomosis. How to diagnose trust? Uh, mainly clinical, uh, when the patient deteriorates, the uh, renal function deteriorates, patient develops uh, uh, accelerated hypertension, and a brewery, this is when we diagnose, and we can easily diagnose now with ultrasound and MR angiogram and confirm with an angiogram. Ultrasound, uh, the definition is. Uh, if the transplant uh, uh, renal artery peak velocity more than two millimeters, or if the velocity at the gradient segment is more than two times the previous segment, we can diagnose as uh, transplant renal artery stenosis. And CT is usually avoided because of uh, fear of contrast nephropathy. But MR angio is the ideal, is the imaging of choice. We can, it can not only pick up the renal artery stenosis, but also pick up other things like collections, infarcts, cytonephrosis, et cetera. MR also will show whether it is a, uh, it's a stenosis or a kinky, which is also seen sometimes. And it will also see the, give an idea about the takeoff of the transfer renal artery, whether it is upward takeoff or downward takeoff, based on that we can find out, we can decide whether we should uh, uh, approach ipsilaterally or contralaterally. So MR angiogram, uh, if you use gadolinium dye, especially in patients with the low GFR, there is a risk of uh, systemic sclerosis, but gadolinium is not required. If uh, now we have MRI with the 1.5 Tesla and more, so gadolinium is not required. MR angiogram plain without contrast itself is very, very, very accurate. And the MRI will also give the best angiographic angle because MRI, uh, because in most of the trans uh, AP views and lateral views are useless. We have to have a, a angled view like aleocaudal, aleocranial like that. MRI will, uh, we can rotate the film and see which is the angle. For example, in this, you can see the anterolateral, something like a leo view. And uh, we can confirm it with the uh, angiogram. You can see the angiogram, the same view. You can uh, nicely see the uh, transplant lateral stenosis. So approach to the case, we have to discuss with the nephrologist uh, and confirm that it is required. We can discuss with the radiologist. We have to see whether the Doppler really shows more than two meters per second uh, to find out that there is definitely stenosis. And also MRI, we have to discuss with the radiologist uh, to say whether it's an uptake, upward takeoff or a downward takeoff, which is the artery, to, uh, which is anastomosis, which are, uh, that is anastomosis to external iliac, internal iliac, all those things you have to discuss with the radiologist. Transplant surgeon also will sometimes help and operative notes, especially if there's a long uh, done more than six months or one year, operative notes are important. And uh, of course, measures to prevent the uh, contrast induced nephropathy. Access, uh, ipsilateral versus contralateral, if it is a end-to-end -end anastomosis to internal iliac, we obviously we have to approach from the contralateral side like this. Uh, if it is a, a external iliac artery end to side, then we have to rely on the MRI. If the MRI shows upward up, uh, take, then we have to come ipsilaterally from the ipsilaterally femoral. If it is a downward takeoff, like the, again, MRI will uh, nicely tell whether it's a downward takeoff of the renal artery. In this case, we have to again come from the contralateral side, contralateral side. Access, uh, most of the uh, stents can be passed through a six of sheath, uh, uh, either done ipsilaterally. If you use contralaterally, you always use the a crossover sheath like a cook balkan sheath which is very important. AP views are not useful. If it is a anastomosis is end-to-end -to, -end to a right internal iliac artery, LAO view is the ideal. 
if it's a right external linear cartridge, usually RAO with a cr cranial view is the most uh, uh, useful. Carbon dioxide angiography is also useful in some cases. Our experience with carbon dioxide angiography, the picture quality was not very good. So we use it only ancillary. And uh, this is a classical view, LAO caudal view, which is, uh, you can see in plain, plain AP view, you don't usually see the stenosis very well. But in the LAO caudal view, this is a very good view for uh, uh, the right side at internal iliac, end-to-end -end anastomosis to transplantary arteries. External iliac artery uh, anastomosis, end-to-side anastomosis. Again, you can see plain AP view, not very uh, useful. But if you use a RAO cranial view, you can see in the lower down, you can see the artery coming with an stenosis nicely. So RA cranial mainly for anastomo, uh, real transplant anastomosis to the external iliac artery. Occasionally, no view will show critical stenosis, no view. So we have to reconfirm the clinical uh, renal function, Doppler, MRI data with the radiologist, nephrologist. Sometimes IFR is now being used. We have used uh, one case here, uh, multiple views. We have checked uh, the radiologist says there's a severe stenosis. The patient is having hypertension and, uh, and uh, deteriorating renal function. But uh, then we did an IFR and IFR was 0.7 and then we did a, a stenting for this case. Guiding catheters, uh, I can either use a, a six French multipurpose or a six French JR catheter. But sometimes, you know, these, these arteries are very, very tortuous. And unlike the normal renal artery, which is just iota osteal, this you have to go very, very tortuous. So sometimes you use the neuron catheter that is used for uh, brain intervention, intracranial intervention. These are expensive catheters, almost 20, 25,000 rupees, but they are so soft and so atraumatic, we can go to all these uh, branches. Uh, uh, Subselection by guideliner is not uh, work, not useful because the these renal stents don't go through the, the guideliners. So so this is again another uh, case you can see uh, a very very curved internal iliac artery. The stents was not passing, so we had to uh, put a, a glide catheter across along O1 for VTC uh, uh, wire, and uh, with that uh, we put a, uh, through the glide catheter we put a thermo wire. And through the thermo wire, we put that neuron catheter. So the neuron catheter is going to go very deep, and uh, then we can easily uh, stent across the lesion. So guide wire selection, I think uh, normal standard wires are useful, but sometimes extreme curves we have to use, uh, like this case, uh, it was very difficult to uh, negotiate that U curve. We used the whisper in this case. And stent selection, uh, um, most renal stents are useful, but sometimes these lesions are extremely curved and uh, uh, the standard uh, tough renal stents, which are mainly used for iota osteal lesions, usually don't pass. Nowadays, we use open cells, open cell design like Herculean Galite uh, open, open stent, uh, because these are open uh, cells, these are very trackable and very uh, deployable, and uh, we need only small atmos, two to four atmos for this case. Post dilatation, avoid in early lesions, but in uh, late renal artery stenosis, you can post dilate. Antiplatelet you usually give the dual antiplatelet with aspirin clopidogrel alone, no role for other antiplatelets uh, for one year and single antiplatelet. These are uh, uh, some of the standard cases. You can see uh, standard tight renal artery, transplant renal artery stenosis in the uh, end to end anastomosis uh, to the internal iliac artery, uh, easily uh, wired and uh, stented, and we get a very good uh, uh, result with a six millimeter stent. And uh, uh, restenosis rates uh, is uh, at five years is uh, with, if you do angioplasty alone is very high, but uh, if you do stenting, it's only 10%. And now there's a landmark paper that even at uh, five year survival of uh, transplant renal artery patients post stenting is similar to post transplant patient who did not have TRAS, 76% versus 73%. That is why in all renal artery stenosis causing uh, hemodynamic or functional issues, you should always treat it and stent it because the post the survival is similar to a patient without renal artery stenosis. Now we have even the 20 year data, 20 year data showing that renal artery patients who are uh, uh, undergoing TRAS, renal artery stenting, their long term data even up to 20 years is similar to a patient who never developed renal artery stenosis. So. Uh, once you have a, even if you have a renal artery stenosis post transplant, uh, don't be disheartened. You can still have a survival equal to a person without renal artery stenosis by stenting. Only uh, uh, 
we have never used uh, st angioplasty alone, but in some lesions uh, like this bifurcation alone, this is a patient with a typical severe bi bifurcation alone. And here we used a kissing balloon technique and uh, 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 you can see the uh, bilateral uh, kissing balloon and uh, post kissing balloon, we get a very good uh, re uh, uh, result. So this patient is still in follow up, but uh, whenever possible, don't stop with balloon, always stent. This is another patient, uh, we had a uh, renal artery stenosis immediately after surgery. You can see in the external iliac artery, you can see the renal artery, only Timmy one flow in the transplant. This happened the second day the transplant. So uh, in this case, we just did a balloon. Uh, it was a downward take of the artery. You can see the downward take of the artery. So from the contralateral side, we put a balloon and uh, we dilated and uh, we, you can see good flow in the renal artery. But we did only balloon. And after uh, three months, the patient again developed uh, hypertension and worsening creatinine. So we, we looked at again, you can see there is a severe stenosis again because we did only ballooning, severe stenosis. And uh, uh, this time you can see it is the, the renal artery uh, and that geometry has changed. It is now an upward take. Previously it was a downward take off. Now it's an upward take. So you have to use a ipsilateral catheter and uh, uh, balloon it and stand it. And uh, now you, you get a good result. So early anastomosis dissection sometimes occurs like this. Uh, you can see this, you can see dissection uh, of the artery. Uh, you can see in caudal and cranial view and uh, stented with the renal arteries and you can see the final picture, nice uh, uh, post stenting. And uh, this is a patient who had a trans uh, after second transplant. You can see the second artery is in the left external iliac. You can see tight stenosis at, from the external iliac artery uh, approach from ipsilateral because of upward takeoff and uh, uh, standard and uh, you can stand it exactly into the ostium and you can get a good uh, flow into the renal artery. So uh, transplant renal artery thrombosis is also an issue. If it is a non-occlusive thrombus, you can get a, guess, get a nice uh, uh, result from heparinization, but if it's a full occlusion, very difficult. This is another one patient who had a full thrombotic occlusion and uh, even when we did, uh, there was no much uh, result. A full thrombotic occlusion sometimes a resistant to treatment. So to conclude, uh, Transplant renal artery stenosis uh, occurs about uh, 2 to 5 percent of uh, uh, post transplant. You should diagnose it early. And uh, MRA is uh, very helpful. 1.5 Tesla MRA will give you uh, all information, including the best angle to work, so that you need not uh, use more and more dye to find out which angle is the best. MRA will give you the operator's angle. No gadolinium required. Uh, angio, limited angio alone, always tend the patient whenever possible. You be uh, familiar with the hardware like uh, um, uh, neuron catheter, subselection, and uh, also uh, uh, open cell uh, stents, which can uh, track through all these uh, curvy lesions. And uh, uh, the outcomes are excellent. Uh, even long term, 20 year survival is something similar to patients who have never received uh, trans, uh, uh, never developed transplant renal artery stenosis. Thank you so much uh, for a patient hearing and I'm uh, uh, stopping here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, for wonderful deliberation and finishing exactly within time limit. So we'll discuss the question session, question and answer session later on. Now I would like uh, Dr. Anup Singh to introduce Dr. Neeraj Avasti for his next talk. Uh, next speaker is Dr. Neeraj Avasti. He is a consultant pediatric interventionist and currently he is working in Max Hospital Delhi. He regularly visits to Patna and did uh, severe pediatric interventions. I have also assisted him and it is our privilege to gain something from him. Now topic is recent advances in pediatric cardiac intervention. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Nira, sir, we are audible. Please unmute first. Please unmute. Please unmute. Am I audible? Am I visible? Yes, no. yes, yes, yes. Nira, sir, please start here. Thank you, Dr. Anu, for uh, the wonderful introduction. And I thank uh, the, the CSI chapter uh, uh, 
uh, Bihar for such a wonderful organization and inviting for this talk. I will directly go to the topic in the interest of time. And definitely the interaction in, in as Dr. Nupa said, uh, in Patna and Bihar with all the people has been wonderful and encouraging. And we have been, we have, we have been doing some of the most uh, intrigue of all the cases from this particular region. Uh, yes, many interventions, which I will, few of them would be, would we have done it together and we I have tried to incorporate that in the present presentation. So when I talked of recent intervention, we have come a long way okay, from pulmonary valvotomy, from atrial septostomy, from pulmonary stenosis. And the challenge is to be perfect, perfect as the long-term surgical outcome. So that is why it has to be as perfect shot as Tandurkar used to play, or I would say uh, Kohli is playing and so many youngsters who are doing the job wonderfully well. But it has to be as delicate as wearing bangles without injuring the hand and doing it fantastically. So it has to be an ideal device, an ideal balloon, a proper case selection, perfect execution of device or stand placements with minimal or nine, no, no side effects and no residual leak. The bar has gradually been raised. We started off with doing ASDs, PDAs, then VSDs, went on to do uh, AP windows, which is now commonly done, and many fistulas which are being done. With each subsequent uh, new case which comes, every case comes as a challenge, you know. So initially we were doing isolated VSDs and then came these, uh, these, sorry, these multiple VSDs which are being closed with multiple devices. The new techniques in the form of balloon assisted technique, the right upper pulmonary vein approach. So these multiple devices, which, which I'm sorry for this. Uh, so multiple devices which we have, which we have been doing for for uh, uh, say different approaches usage utilizing different techniques to uh, lodge in the devices and of course uh, these different techniques have have let us evolve the placement of devices in a different way i think my presentation wants to move faster okay so in nutshell, the process has to be safe, effective in selected group of patients. Yes, VSDs were, these VSDs have all been, been, been a challenge. Look at this 14 year old, a non-restrictive VSD would, who would ever have thought that a non-restrictive VSD would have become operable at 14 years of age. But this particular patient underwent a VSD device after cardiac catheterization and assessing operability when he was operable underwent a VSD device closures. And probably this is the largest VSD device and the PA pressures were absolutely normal. The improvisation continued and utilizing this classical PDA AD02 device, which was meant for uh, atrial duct occluder and utilizing for it for closing the atrial uh, for the VSD device occluders. Again, showing the echocardiography of same patients, wonderful device deployment, no side effects, laminar flow in LVOTs and no ARs, and device causing no residual shunts. PDAs have always been uh, something which we thought were very usual. And that is why a safer and more safer options were being considered, like this particular coil, which is being deployed, a ADO1 device, which is commonly used. And then came a very softer version, the ADO2 duct occluder, which is so soft that it can be deployed from the aortic end. And more of them are now being deployed by VSDs rather than ASDs. The challenge continued. And this is something which is very recent and very new. We were uh, happy to conduct uh, among the first Piccolo preterm PDA device closures, which is which we are capable to close in even 700 gram babies, which are stuck on ventilators with a device. Classically, these were being closed by surgical techniques. Now, there you see a Piccolo. This was actually the first one which was closed in this part of the world. Uh, and there you see a wonderful normal function, laminar flow in the left pulmonary artery, a normal flow in the descending aorta, and the child doing wonderful well after almost two months of the deployment. And subsequently, we have deployed it in many other preterm babies who are doing equally well. The bar was gradually raised. Ruptured sinus of Valsalva which was always a surgical uh, domain, 
why not do it with the device yes a pda duct occluder and subsequently a muscular vsd occluder were also deployed in fact in patna only we had deployed a muscular vsd of a 14 mm child uh, 14 mm uh, rsov which is quite large with a significant shunt who ca actually came in failure and was in distress and was immediately relieved after the procedure as soon as the procedure finished that is the beauty of an intervention that you get instant results the challenge continued there is this patient who is again from patna who has underwent who is actually a son was son of a of a doctor she was stuck on a ventilator with a elevator pulmonary window in one of the hospitals when the call was received and subsequently underwent a, the chest was very bad and a very poor subset for a ap window surgical closure it was then the ap window closure was done with a device and the patient was extubated the next day and is under follow up uh, so this has been almost uh, uh, two or three years since the procedure has been done and similar is the story of the second case where you see a 11th month old child who came with gross lv dilatation ventricular dysfunction and the cause was unknown but what was there was this unusual fistula which was lying in the lungs which was closed with a duct occluder device ado2 so the pre pre preview of the duct occluder device is gradually being expanded not only for uh, the usual classical cases but for ap windows for these abnormal shunt lesions and for systemic avms as has been done for this last case which was again a significant rarv dilatation with a sequestration lung segment without any clinical manifestations uh, obvious clinical manifestations the coronary artery fistulas again sh shows how a device can be utilized optimally here you find a case of a coronary artery fistula to right atrium which is being closed with a with a device the pulmonary avi tri fistulas initially the coil closures were done and subsequently by this rotational angiography utilizing the duct, uh, the vascular plug we could close Good these evening, respected teachers the uh, pulmonary avms with this particular I device and this uh, this is wonderful conference particle the preview of uh, the device particularly yeah, we will discuss the cardiovascular expanded and device is constantly looking for an apt patient where it can expand for itself this particular patient who had a lv pseudo aneurysm underwent a mitral valve repair as replacement twice in her life ended up with a large pseudo aneurysm which was arising from the left ventricle and this was in year 2016 as you can say a 59 year old lady who has underwent a vas muscular vsd closure of the pseudo aneurysm until this day she is asymptomatic doing wonderfully well and thus avoiding a redo surgery which we all know redo surgeries have has got its own implications so a uh, apt use of a device can actually uh, be seen beyond the preview of its usual manifestations this particular talk would uh, the device would not be complete if we say that yes there is arrival of atrial flow regulator this is again 2 years since khushi a 12 year old girl who is a case of idiopathic pulmonary artery hypertension sorry i couldn't remove that name so i, I utilize it for the, for everybody and with the consent of the patient that this particular patient was having multiple syncopes and the reason being severe pulmonary artery hypertension where rv is not able to pump the blood into the ventricles so the deployment of this atrial flow resistor enabled flow into the left atrium and left ventricle as is being demonstrated by the contrast injection into the ra and rv which is filling up the left side and thus preventing the syncope in this child who is doing wonderfully well always an attempt is made to look for patent ductus arteriosus in any case of idiopathic ph like the second case where deployment of a pda stent help prevent syncopes and decompressing the pulmonary vascular bed we uh, we have published in 2015 unconventional uses of septal occluder devices uh and since then probably these experiences are almost reach i would not it would not be wrong if we say we have almost tripled it actually much 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 more than the classical publication the pub publication showed it to be used in coronary fistulas systemic avs fistulas rsovs 
content fenestration closures, paravalvular leaks, AP windows, ascending aorta perforations, splenic artery occlusions for, for a patient who was almost bleeding, utilizing in BT shunt closures. Going on from the shunts to valvular stenosis. Classically, balloon are a treatment of choice, be it for aortic stenosis or pulmonary stenosis, because they are safe, excellent immediate results, lower complication rate, good long-term results, better hardwares, and innovative hardwares are available. But remember, I, I would say that we in India not only innovate, but what is called a jugard. Well, jugard is not an Indian terminology. It has got an Oxford, it is a terminology which, which is an Oxford dictionary, right? And the uh, jugard means utilizing optimally what we resources we have. And we all must have utilized this Innova balloon for BMVs. And occasionally, here you see one of the patients from Patna. Uh, with the procedure being done in Patna, utilizing the Inoue balloon with uh, for doing a balloon pulmonary valvotomy in a grown-up patients. The results of BPV are excellent. Of 165 patients of a 14-year follow-up, which we published uh, in, uh, I think, uh, 2016, only two patients required re-intervention and none of them required surgery. This is the largest study in the country. And same is the story for BPV uh, with the similar results published in 2016. Coming on to other stenotic lesions such as coarctations, as you see in this particular case, balloon is a treatment of choice when the patient is small, can be done for grown-ups for a discrete coarctations. But yes, stenting is always advisable whenever beyond nine years or 25 kgs with excellent long-term results. This example is well justified by uh, this patient who was a 13-year-old patient diagnosed with severe dextrocardia with severe ventricular dysfunction, who came in the emergency and collapsed. The first image will clearly show you, as we inject, the descending aorta is filling, getting filled from the subclavian into the descending aorta. That means there is an interrupted aortic arch. This particular patient, for life-saving measure, underwent direct puncture of the interruption. And subsequently, we could balloon this particular interruption went on and dilated the ascending aorta with a smaller than a larger balloon. It's a dextrocardia. That is why you see images just at the opposite. And this was the final results. He is doing wonderfully well, even after uh, four years. And so now he has been stented, actually. That time, we didn't have a stent on shelf. And this was a life-saving. The patient had crashed and the patient was shifted as a primary and was undergoing a CPR. It's when this process the is being it crashes to the host cell uh, through the AS2 receptors and the TMP RSS uh, Hello. So the the procedure we all know about balloon atrial septostomy, which is commonly utilized for newborns, and balloon atrial septal dilatation and atrial sept septum stenting, which is can, can be done for grown-up pulmonary artery hypertensions with the, or those with having this uh, hypertensive RAs where RA needs a decompression. The horizons of interventions in pediatric cardiology has been expanded. Tetralogy is always a surgical domain and would always remain to be a surgical domain because that's the best results nowadays. But for patients who is a sicker subgroup, who is unsuitable for RVOT, we would say RVOT stenting or ballooning can be done. This is the first ever case which has been stented for right ventricular tract of a case of tricuspid atresia. The study was published uh, the, in uh, last year in uh, catheter card in uh, uh, cardiovascular in the young, the European uh, general, which showed that how RVOT stent can be useful in case of tricuspid atresia. So the, definitely the horizons of all these things have been expanded. The coronary stents, which are commonly available in each and every cath lab, can be easily utilized for stenting the PDAs, which we are commonly doing as a rule for all the pre all the newborns who come to us. The pericardial tap, a common procedure, and we all know how to do a pericardial tap. Uh, and through the apex now, classically, it was always a subcostal approach. The last part of the presentation would be on valves. And I would say TAVI is something which is now a household name, commonly done in many parts. And this is the first pulmonary valve, which we did in 2016. And this is the first in this part of the world which we did. And this patient has now undergone uh, his COVID infections also. He had a COVID infection. He was admitted with COVID infection. Uh, he had a vegetation over the pulmonary valve. 
and that too even with all that his pulmonary valves are doing perfectly fine with no leakages and this was almost 4 years and that time it was the largest pulmonary valve ever deployed anywhere in the world so yes pulmonary valves rvots are now a thing which can be easily performed so for all the interventions we have seen the there has been a magnitude of change with more and more in, more lesions coming under the preview of interventions the interventions in pipeline this was one of the oldest slide which i presented when we had a hybrid conference which was uh, of uh, if many people would remember of of congenital heart and and uh, electrophysiology it was almost 4 5 years back and this slide was shown and i would like to say percutaneous valve replacements i said were intervention in the pipeline now it is a routine tai we all know pulmonary valves are in fontan completions was in the pipeline and now fontan completion is being done with a covered stent it is in pulmonary artery bending was in the pipeline now we are i'm happy to announce that we have done the fenestrated uh, closures of the devices utilizing it is at band the fetal interventions was a, was interventions in pipeline now we are doing it for pulmonary stenosis aortic stenosis restricted intraatrial communication because these three lesions are incompatible with survival when the patient the child is in utero yes we are also doing it for intractable arrhythmias and thus catheter interventions are important in management of congenital heart diseases they can offer cure palliation and these are extra interventions are extremely useful in managing post of residual complications if any and preventing many of the surgical interventions thank you thank you everyone for giving this opportunity to interact thank you dr neeraj for thought and probably 30 time. seconds uh, we can have some questions you have concluded in time and uh, question answer will be on the, on the last of the sessions now i would like to uh, ask dr rajiv krishna to invite dr dilip for his deliberation on cardiogenic shock in acs patients dr rajiv krishna please yeah so dr dilip is a known figure in our part of world he is a consultant cardiologist at medica hospital kolkata and he is known for complex interventions and devices he keeps going to bangladesh for device implantation and complex interventions and we have also learnt a lot from him at patna he keeps coming to bless us so let's uh, hear from him about cardiogenic shock in acute setting dr dilip sir okay so uh... let me begin and uh, i will compensate for the time uh, maybe and uh, the topic uh, given to me rajiv i am audible well audible sir go ahead thank you thank you so uh, my topic is cardiogenic shock in acute pulmonary syndrome and uh, cardiogenic shock is a common cause of mortality and in spite of so many advances still this is a you know challenging uh, kind of uh, uh, subject and uh, the mortality rate is still varying from 40 to 50% and once once it comes to defining cardiogenic shock there has been some heterogeneity and uh, but the acceptable definition is uh, what uh, the iibp shock two trialists uh, they they accepted the trial, the uh, definition of cardiogenic shock was when the systolic blood pressure is less than 90 and is sustained for 30 minutes more than 30 minutes or the patient is being given pharmacological or mechanical support to maintain the cp and the evidence of end organ hyperperfusion varied between trials and you know guidelines in definition of uh, cardiogenic shock but definitely it included uh, urine output of less than 30 ml per hour cool extremities altered mental status and or serum lactate of more than 2 but this all comes with the patient who is having a eu volumic status so this is the distribution of reasons for cardiogenic shock uh, and the acute coronary syndrome definitely comprises uh, the biggest uh, you know the contributor and amongst the spectrum of acute coronary syndrome stemi is the uh, biggest reason and it's associated with a two fold increased risk of uh, development of cardiogenic shock compared with non stemi but but since non stemi patients uh, the intervention is the when the cardiac surgeons they tend to wait to stabilize the patient to pull off the you know Uh, there is no stemi so let's wait for some time so these reasons make the mortality of non stemi cardiogenic shock patients even more than stemi cardiogenic shock patients so uh, uh so this is a, basically the pathophysiology once there is a cardiac injury uh, it happens mostly because of uh, ischemia but there can be a kind of 
cardiitis, uh, arrhythmia, attack of supercardiomyopathy. Uh, patient can go in cardiogenic shock, but today I will be confining myself to ischemic heart disease, so acute cardiac injury, ischemia, the blood pressure goes down, there is a kind of a responsive peripheral vasoconstriction, that kind of, that, then there is a surge-like picture, and th there is a self-perpetuating negative feedback happens, which takes the patient spirally downwards, and finally the patient you know, succumbs. So we have to intervene early and uh, the therapy options are right from beginning, we have to start the supportive medical therapy. And uh, as far the monitoring is concerned, the additional monitoring is PA catheter monitoring. So uh, once your catheter is in PA, you can uh, kind of uh, get a mitral, uh, you know, mixed venous oxygen saturation, which will guide you to uh, take steps. And it will also guide you to uh, have a kind of exact fluid balance to the patient. If the patient is on mechanical ventilation, tidal volume should be on the lower side, like should not be on higher side. And once it will be a lesser uh, than what we give normally, then the chances of RV failure will be less. And the treatment finally depends on revascularization. And uh, the early quick revascularization is important. And you may require circulatory support here and that we will be discussing in coming slides. Coming to inotropes, uh, in cardiogenic shock, noradrenaline is the preferred, uh, you know, inotrope of choice. We start with norad, we, then we uh, go with adrenaline and orbitamine, and finally dopamine. But vasopressin we add when there is a concomitant RV failure, as the vasopressin, you know, dilates the pulmonary vasculature. So it depends uh, on RV function whether vasopressin has to be added or not. Coming to revascular. Uh, revascularization strategy. Uh, this was a point of contention for a long time, whether we go for a culprit vessel or a full revascularization. And uh, this was the guideline in 2017. Till then we had kind of uh, idea that if the patient is in cardiogenic shock, let's uh, open up all the vessels. And that is the only reason uh, and only way of uh, you know salvaging these patients. And uh, the guidelines very clearly showed that non-IRA uh, PCI during the index procedure should be considered in patients with cardiac shock. But later on in one year, it went totally, you know, it turned around and uh, ESC 2018 guideline very clearly recommended in cardiogenic shock, routine, routine vascularization of non-IRA lesions is not recommended during primary PCI. And it was not only 2B, it was a class three indication. So it, it gives us a harmful effect. And that understanding, this was, a, this was a change in guideline in only one year. 2017, there was something else. 2018, there was something else. And, uh, and it is very clear, and it is based on robust data with large meta-analysis. And the final kind of a nail in the coffin was given by culprit shock trial. So this was a large trial with 83 centers and uh, 350, around 350 patients in each arm where patients were uh, being revascularized only culprit vessel. And in the other round, all the kind of uh, vessels were treated on immediate basis, the same catheter uh, procedure. And the result was, result was quite, uh, 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 quite in favor of culprit vessel angioplasty only. You can appreciate a 30-day uh, result, all-cause mortality or renal replacement therapy. Uh, the culprit vessel arm showed significant reduction, the Kaplan marker. Uh, reveals and all cause mortality 30 days are also significantly less. This was a uh, one year all cause mortality subgroups. So, here also the culprit vessel angioplasty was found to be better. And uh, this was a case which we did. Uh, uh, it was a 59 year old male diabetic. He came with the inferior MI of 10 hours duration. His BP was 92 by 40, and uh, uh, mean arterial blood pressure of uh, 60 only was on inotropes, two inotropes, ejection fraction was 30-35%. He was uh, kind of tachypneic on BiPAP. And uh, this was the, uh, this was the uh, left side, uh, complete total of Luzen. And uh, right was uh, having an infarcted artery. So it was maybe autothrombolysis happened, the recanalized vessel, but still there was very, very critical disease here. The patient was, uh, although this infarcted right coronary artery, infarcting vessel, uh, infarcted vessel, right coronary artery was, you know, the source of survival of this patient. So in the first, uh, the same procedure, same setting, we did the right coronary artery angioplasty, a quick 
stent and uh, in these situations when the stakes are very high we don't go for a uh, post dilatation as small slow flow of three four five minutes of slow flow i think patient would succumb so we kept it there and then in the next sitting uh, after seven days we opened the uh, led cto this was the guy wire and uh, two long stents and then uh, finally the patient is still doing well with ejection fraction of 48% after one and a half years of follow up so uh, had it been uh, something a uh, strategy where we would have gone for both the vessels probably the result would not have been the same and the guidelines they now clearly say that you have to go for an ira you know angioplasty only but many of many of the times we encounter patients uh, who are sick and uh, they are require even uh, some circulatory support device otherwise uh, their bp is in 70s 60s and they are going downward and the devices which are available to us are ibp which gives her only 0 to 1 liter of um, uh, you know increased cardiac output impella 2.5 cp and impella 5 and impella ld is also available and uh, tandem heart is not available with us and v ecmo which gives to up to 5 uh, from starting from 2 to 7 liter of uh, flow cardiac output so uh, yeah so the idea of uh, this uh, all circulatory support devices is to reduce the uh, kind of lv unloading and reduce the work force of oxygen uh, the increased oxygen demand myocardium and uh, this uh, pressure volume loop is a certain concept we must appreciate it that if we move down the curve to left and downwards we are going to have less oxygen demand of the myocardium and lv is getting unloaded but when it goes to right the heart the stress so when we patients come ho gaya hoga aaj hum thoda dawa le ke khana khane mein ha ha aaye to kahan pe kahan ho jayega unmute others unmute others dum ghabrahat ho jayega heart attack ho jata hai dawai ye khana theek rahe khelwar nahi kare dag sugar ke dawai se so uh, when we can we have mic muted there is a lot of noise please mute others yeah so uh, kind of for once we give inotropes you can appreciate this uh, red uh, the loop goes to right is reflected in green uh, you know color and there is a increased myocardial oxygen demand and which is which can be sometimes detrimental is very uh, useful for a certain time and then it really gives us the floppy side of uh, inotropes iabp gives us a very small increase in cardiac output and very small reduction in pcwp and the support we get is very very less this is the v ecmo v ecmo definitely increases the cardiac output but increases the after load and increases the pre load so it has to be added with either an iabp or an impella reduce uh, after load and uh, after load and many times when you put v ecmo in these patients cardiogenic shock patients there is a further lv ballooning happens so it has to be complemented with iabp or an uh, impella and uh, impella we all uh, uh, we know that it very clearly and efficiently unloads the left ventricle so impella is the best therapy available followed by uh, v ecmo with uh, iabp or uh, impella in addition these are the trials uh, with uh, iabp and unfortunately all of them have kind of uh, were borderline one or two trials were positive majority of them were negative but still it was being used but finally iabp shock two trial gave us a very clear idea that iabp definitely doesn't give us a survival difference uh, if you go for an iabp or no iabp you open the artery there is no difference in survival at 30 days one year and six years and that's why iabp is going out of favor and it's not being used less used rather we definitely use in situations where we don't have anything else these are the trials with uh, uh, impella and biggest problem with impella trials are uh, for randomized controlled trials are getting these patients and these are very sick patients very small trials are there and these are also not very clear survival benefit is not shown in the randomized controlled trial basis we ecmo again the situation is similar we don't have any clear cut idea guidelines randomized controlled trials which says that okay we ecmo has to be used uh, uh, and these are still in uh, you know uh, studies are going on and you can look at the recruitment levels of the different trials with impella very few numbers 52 and you know 26 384 so these patients were very very limited and results 
were found to be borderline. But when it comes to registry data, Impella showed very, very robust data. You can appreciate 46,000 patients where Impella was instituted earlier, pre-PCI, the results were far better and survival was seen. So when we institute Impella in patients with cardiogenic shock early, before intervention, we are going to get benefit and in a significant manner. So I will show you two cases before concluding. So this was a case uh, who came with a kind of a non STEMI and uh, he was surgically turned down by our surgical colleague after waiting for 48 hours. He was maintaining the issue of KT, had critical left main LED and circumflex osteum disease. So we put the patient on uh, IABP. We did a uh, uh, kind of a tap technique for uh, LMC uh, circumflex and LED stent. So LMCA to circumflex first stent, it was a large dominant artery. And uh, then the tap technique, the LED stent, final kissing balloon, and this was the result. We could remove the IBP and patient uh, finally went home and is still doing well. Uh, this was a patient which uh, we uh, treated during this pandemic. This was 46 year old male and uh, he was diabetic, entry MI of 12 hours, BP of 98 by 60, heart rate of 110 per minute, and his saturation was borderline and his, he was on inotropes. Look at the ECG, ECG showing RBB with uh, gross ST elevation in multiple leads. And this was the uh, ECO uh, showing a severe tachycardia with uh, apex, mid septum, mid end septum, akinetic, but still muscle mass was there. The right coronary artery, uh, there was a moderate disease, not significant disease. And this LED was occluded from the proximal part. So we did a quick angioplasty to LED. Uh, there was a large diagonal. We uh, secured the large diagonal. We put two stents in the LED. And uh, with all the, there was a slow flow and with all the cocktails, the SNP and everything, uh, Nicorandil, Adenosine, the, uh, after 10, 15 minutes of struggle, we got this flow. So we left it there as patients were, patient was getting more and more tachypnic. And uh, we made the patient sit and we could uh, uh, manage this patient on BiPAP. Next day, he was doing well. His BP was 110 by 70, heart rate of 100. No, there was anotrope was also, you know, uh, could be omitted, uh, tapered off. And next day, we were thinking that patient would be okay and uh, he will be through. But a day after, he developed severe pulmonary edema. He had to ventilate it. IABP was put on. And even on IABP, after two, three uh, hours, his BP was in 70s, augmented BP pH of 7.21, lactate of 4.1. So we were quite hopeless that time because on IBP, on inotropes, his BP was in 70s. We thought of checking, this was the ECG of the patient at that time. So we thought of checking the uh, LED, the, 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 which we uh, had opened. And you can see the IBP and the uh, uh, flow, which was still there with TM3 flow, diagonal was also flowing well. And it was very intrigued what to do with this patient. His arteries are flowing, his muscle is so he, he had to sustain for quite some time and so that his myocardium would recover. And, at the, and then we went for, a, and since the pH was dropping, lactate was climbing up, we went for an ECMO. This is the v, v ECMO port you can appreciate. And there is a anti-grade seven French cannula. Uh, the ECMO uh, uh, is a 21 French arterial sheet we use, access we have to use. And venous, it's a 24 French venous sheet has to be used. So uh, many times we get a flow, less flow in uh, lower limbs because of the large cannula, which obstructs the entire vessel from the artery. So this is a, you can appreciate the seven French sheet in anti-grade fashion, which was vascularizing the lower limb. So the patient was put on IABP and ECMO, and he was kept on for nine days. And we were coming out down with the flow, but the patient was not doing well, and then we were increasing. So we had, we took, it, it took nine days for the ECMO to come out and then next day IBP was removed. This was the uh, kind of uh, ECMO of the patient and the SCG shows very clear cut resolution and uh, a very good sinus rhythm. There was no arrhythmia. And uh, this gentleman finally met after 15 days of struggle during this pandemic. He was in, uh, he was in uh, primary PCI with a cardiogenic shock, revascularized, patent stent on check angio, finally went on uh, ECMO for nine days, ECMO and IBP. Fortunately, the LV didn't get dilated because uh, the IBP was there to unload it. And uh, it was a 
story which uh, Mr. Chakravarti is still telling. Uh, and he could not have survived had we not gone for a mechanical circulatory support device like uh, ECMO. So he was almost gone with pH going down 7.1 on IABP uh, revascularized vessels, pit and flow. So these are uh, some of the uh, cases uh, where uh, circulatory support devices are must. And with all these advances, the cardiogenic shock survival from 17% in 1973 has gone to 77% in 2018. And it's now even climbing up. So we, if we go with the uh, all out therapy with all the uh, kind of uh, devices available to us, therapy, the results uh, keeps on uh, getting better and better. But important is we have to know the right devices and institute in the time. So Impella is there with us, but it requires a lot of cost around 20, 18 to 20, 20 lakhs uh, cost it requires. And it's a wonderful device and it offloads the LV like anything. It increases the cardiac output. But VA ECMO is one device which is available in most of the centers, advanced centers. And uh, the, the, the cost is something around three to five lakhs. And if the patient goes for five, six days, then it, is, it will go to 10, 12 lakhs. So it's not like Impella. And if with IABP, it can be a lifesaver in many patients. And IABP can get away, we can get away on IABP many patients to have a borderline, uh, you know, cardiac shock with a quick revascularization if we can do. And the support is enough in many cases. So thank you so much for the patient hearing. And I hope we'll have questions in there. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you, sir, for your nice deliberation. In near future, within two to three months, we will expect more practical aspect from you, sir. And uh, we will uh, learn more about ECMO and all. Uh, cardiac life supports. So thanks again. Now I would like to request Arvind sir to introduce uh, Pramod sir. Thank you. Uh, uh, good evening. Uh, it's my proud privilege to uh, welcome and invite Dr. Pramod Kumar sir, who has been uh, my teacher and mentor in the knowledge of intervention cardiology. I have learned so many things from him. Still, uh, uh, he is helping us in so many ways whenever he used to come to Patna. So, uh, without wasting time, I invite Dr. Pranut Kumar sir to uh, give his uh, talk on uh, radial interventions. Pranut sir, please. Okay, good evening. Uh, can you? Yeah. Yes, can you we hear can me? hear you. Yeah, we can hear you and we can see your introductory slide. Right. Uh, are my slides uh, visible now? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity to talk to all my dear friends. And uh, yes, uh, I'll be going back home very soon to be uh, amongst my dear friends and hope that uh, we'll have a, a fantastic uh, second innings for me. I am an old man, so this will be last innings for me. Thank you very much. Uh, so, I have uh, nothing to uh, disclose as far as this presentation is concerned, except that I have now become a hardcore radialist. Uh, it has been a long journey, but it has been very fruitful. And uh, I, I, I hope that many more join us very soon. In fact, uh, America was the last country to, uh, you know, get on board the uh, radial uh, wagon. And in 2018, the actually the American Heart Association came out with a, a statement that uh, we must, uh, you know, propose and support a radial first strategy in the United States. Uh, most of the Asian countries uh, have been, most of the European countries have been the leaders. And, uh, but still there are many places, it's not part of our formal training program. So that's a big issue uh, because I see that the youngsters who come up, who come to the uh, institutions, you know, most of them are still continuing with femoral when they come to us you know, they have a lot of difficulty in radial. So I think it should be part of our formal training program. And then I'm sure it will take off. So radial versus femoral, I'm sure you're all aware of uh, these slides. Uh, plenty of studies available. 
uh, thousands and thousands of uh, patients now available, which are very clearly showing that one of the major, major advantage of doing a radial is reduction in the major bleeding. Bleeding uh, significant enough to affect the mortality of the uh, group. And as you can see here, uh, in patients who had stable, uh, the top part is showing the patients who have uh, stable uh, ischemic heart disease. If you are using radial, you can see how how very significant, how left to the middle line is the uh, outcome in radial. And again, if you see the uh, situation in acute coronary syndrome, you can also again see that almost every single uh, trial has shown that the bleeding risk is much, much less compared to the femora. In fact, uh, based on these trials, the European Society of Cardiology was the first uh, you know, group to actually recommend that in a, in a center which does radial, the primary PCI should be through the radial as a choice of access. So this is the importance of radial. As you can see here, that there is a definite mortality advantage. There is a definite morbidity advantage in doing radial. But what are the problems uh, with radial? This is the anatomy of the radial. As you can see here, uh, the, uh, the puncture site we actually use is just above the styloid process, above the Palmer crease that you can see here. And, and uh, you know, uh, the, we, we started with uh, going through and through the radial, but now again, even in radial, now we are uh, trying to do an anterior puncture to make sure that the chances of, you know, hematoma and everything is less. So it's very important that, uh, you know, you do radials in your ICUs, in your CCUs, you know, to uh, measure the blood pressure, to have an arterial line, so that everybody who is managing patients should have, uh, you know, an idea how to make a puncture. What I have seen is that when people are shifting from femoral to radial, they have a lot of difficulties because, you know, it's a small artery, it is a, a little, you know, it moves when you are pressing it. So it's very important that you have a good idea where to puncture. What are the issues? Small size, spasm, tortuosity, loops, anomalies, reuse, prevention of occlusion, scarcity of dedicated catheters, both size and shape, and radiation. Again, continuing radial artery occlusion, 2 to 10% spasm, perforation, pseudoaneurysm, arteriovenous fistula, bleeding, nerve damage, and complex regional pain syndrome. These two are very important because there are a lot of times when patients come back after, you know, weeks and week together complaining of pain. So this is something which we have to. What are the uh, contraindications? Uh, severe occlusive disease, complex anatomy, both in the forearm, arm, and at the brachycephalic, you know, complex anatomies, uh, you know, uh, you do have all kind of, uh, then uh, there is a patient who is for candidate, if there is a radial graft to be put, AV fistula for hemodialysis, these days, Allen's or Barbute tests are not uh, indicated. If you can feel the radial, you should go ahead. But there are certain situations where, uh, you know, you can uh, use it, especially in uh, people who have occlusion of the radial and you're going to because a uh, reverse Allen on a Barbute or an ultrasound will actually guide you and help you uh, to find out whether the radial will occ occluded or not. Because sometimes you will find that the disc radius is felt through the palmar arch and you may be mistaken to uh, believe that radial is patent. Again, so that is one uh, situation where these tests are useful. How do we go about the learning curve? This is the European Society of Cardiology. You should start in a healthy, less than 70 year male, not females, and then you should start the diagnostic, go up to type A, type B lesions, go up to stable lesions, uh, complex anatomy, then all complex anatomies, then you should go to non-STMI, then go to STMI. This is the three levels of training they have proposed, which is very important for us. How, the spasm is one of the most important you start with and you get into it. Proper patient selection, especially for beginners, detailed explanation of the procedure. You know, a warmth around the patient in the cath lab is very important. Avoidance of anxiety on the part of the operator is very important. If you are fidgety, you are, you know, not very confident, that actually transmits to the patient and you will find that the spasm is much more in such patients. Proper local anesthesia and sedation, if it is required. Calcium channel blockers, intra-arterial, avoid too many catheter exchanges, use the smallest size which is possible. 
So initial passage, uh, we most of the time now use a JTIP uh, guide wire. And if there is a complex anatomy, you can uh, go with, uh, uh, you know, uh, either uh, thermo wire, which is slippery, but you have to be very careful because you must always fluoro. And then if you are having problems, you can again use a 014 guide wire, the coronary guide wire, and then you can uh, go through the complex anatomies. Balloon assisted tracking is another, I'll show you an example. Size has always been a problem, but one of the, uh, you know, the recent introduction of a uh, glide sheet slender, which is actually the outer diameter is less than a conventional uh, guiding, uh, sheet guiding, whereas the inner diameter is actually similar to the. So uh, this is what it is. Uh, uh, the problem if you are using a larger uh, size sheet is that it can lead to spasm, intimal tear, medial dissection, radial artery occlusion. So it's very important that you should not exceed the uh, one is to one uh, ratio of the sheath and the artery. And as you can see here, an all diagram, how the uh, artery is dissected. So this is what the GSS is a, a Termo introduced guide wire. Uh, it, it comes as five and four, six and five, seven and six. We have started using the seven and six very, very frequently. Uh, whereas we have uh, dedicated by, you know, two stent strategy. In most of the cases, we have been using it. So this is what the event rate has been shown that if you use these, uh, you know, she's the uh, event rate is very acceptable. So this is something which we must use more frequently if you want to use a larger size of the uh, guiding. Radial artery occlusion is again, uh, the incidence is 3.5 mini series. It's more than nine to 10%. Mostly are asymptomatic, mostly the cause, as, I have, as you have seen, device artery ratio, less heparin cocktail, more compression time. So all of these will lead to occlusion. It's very important that you give a very, very, uh, you know, uh, adequate dose of heparin. We mostly use heparin 5,000 international units. And when you are occluding the uh, radial artery, we always put a time and, and, you know, at what time the artery has been occluded and we make sure that it is released after 10 uh, minutes. And ipsilateral ulnar artery operation, uh, uh, suppression, compression when you are occluding the uh, radial artery is also a very important uh, step, which leads to increased flow in the radial artery and improves the potency. So this is something which is uh, very important. Another you know, innovation has been the distal radial artery, which was started by Kim Inji in 2017. And these are the uh, as you can see here, these are the studies which have been uh, published from all over the world, and they have shown that you can get excellent results when you, you're using uh, distal radial artery. We have, we have started using it uh, in both uh, the conventional angiogram as well as in angioplasties. Uh, of course, it's our learning curve, so we are using it mostly in simpler lesions, but uh, it's a beautiful uh, approach and which uh, which has its advantages as you can see here the anatomy and and this is the radial artery which crosses at the base of this snuff box and this is where you actually uh, this is actually the place where you make a puncture it's very very advantageous there is no doubt it's much more comfortable to the patient chances of occlusion is much less avoids compartment syndrome less painful saves proximal radial for future it can also be used for retrograde canalization of the proximal radial uh, disadvantage is smaller, needs longer learning curve, five centimeter below the radial, needs longer catheters, and of course, not practical in cardiogenic shock. Spasm and perforation, this is, uh, I'll just be showing you an example. Uh, this is what you can see that there is a, a severe spasm and a small perforation. And this is what we did uh, with a balloon assisted. Uh, you can see a two millimeter balloon at the tip of the guiding over a coronary guide where has been used to cross this part. And, and, and we did an angiogram after the procedure was over, the artery was very well patent. So this is something which, is, which has really helped us a lot. And then uh, this is actually a femoral uh, uh, angi uh, angioplasty, but what I'm trying to show you is the use of hard end of the guide wire. We use it both for, you know, it gives you a very good control of the tip of the guiding uh, or, or your diagnostic catheter and you can manipulate it the way you want to manipulate it. So I'll just show you how it is done. You can see here, it's very difficult. So when you see it from the beginning, uh, 
yes, this is the beginning. You see, it's so difficult, but when you're pushing the hard end of the, uh, guide, uh, the uh, guide wire, you can manipulate the tip very easily and it, it uh, uh, you know, it jumps into the coronary artery and you can manipulate it the way you want to. It gives a very good torque uh, to you, which is available. This can be used. We use it very frequently for radial because uh, hooking, uh, uh, you know, coronary ostium becomes sometimes very difficult if it is slightly abnormal. So this is something which we have been using both for diagnostic, especially for the right coronary artery. Sometimes with the tiger, you know, it has a tendency to get into the conus branch. So we use the hard tip to lower the, uh, you know, tip of the uh, catheter, which easily hooks the uh, ostium. Uh, the, the, you know, some of the problems which you encounter, this was a, a bifurcation uh, which was being done. Uh, and you see a conventional right coronary guiding catheter, the JR was uh, used. And, and we had, you know, difficulty in crossing the stent. It was a, a stent which was previously, a patient had a previously stent, previous stent. And it was very difficult. And you can see here at how, how the uh, guiding catheter flips out, goes into the LV. So what we did was not very, you know, we immediately changed it to the AL1 uh, guiding catheter. And you can see here how, how nicely the wires have crossed. This was a culoid which was being performed. So this is something, uh, you know, you have to be uh, very aware that change of the guiding catheter and all those things, whenever you feel is required to give you a better, uh, you know, uh, seating the better support, you have to do it immediately. Otherwise, you will keep on. Uh, so this is the final culoid uh, kissing, which is being done. We had an excellent result. So this is something which uh, I'm just trying to tell you that all kinds of interventions, everything can be done through the radial. Uh, this is a six French, uh, uh, you know, uh, guiding catheter through which uh, we are uh, doing a, a IVUS. And then this is the rota, which has been done through the six French. Uh, uh, so if you want to use a larger burr, more than 1.5, then you have to use a larger uh, guiding catheter, but up to 1.25, uh, sometimes even 1.5, if you're using the extra uh, large lumen catheters, then you can easily do these uh, devices very easily. So what I'm trying to tell you is that uh, once you have your guiding catheter seating nicely uh, in the coronary ostium, it doesn't make any difference whether you are using a radial approach or using a femoral approach. But it's very important that uh, you know you 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 choose your hardware well. Uh, you you choose the uh, views. You choose like any any angioplasty. The the everything has to be in a very proper manner. And then, uh, you know, most of the time you'll have a very successful angioplasty. Uh, so in conclusion, I would like to say that radial in majority of uh, cases uh, should be the axis of first choice. There is a small learning curve, no doubt. But if you are working in a dedicated program with an experienced operator, it definitely helps. You follow the ESC guidelines to gradually gain the experience and the expertise. Availability of dedicated catheters in India is certainly the need of the hour. Termo has, and many Japanese companies have, Ashahi and Termo both have introduced dedicated guiding diagnostics, but unfortunately, they're not very easily available in our country. But in coming times, uh, and we, as we grow in, in the, you know, the community grows, certainly we'll have demands and they, I'm sure we'll have. Miniaturization things will definitely improve. In Japan, they have now four French uh, guiding catheters, four French, uh, you know, stents over the wire. Uh, where they use four friend guiding catheters to, be, to do the plasties. So those things are still a little far from uh, our country, but I'm sure in coming times we'll have it. Better understanding and availability of radiation protection programs need to be developed. And that is extremely important because there's no doubt that uh, the procedure time and the fluoroscopy time is slightly higher, especially in the beginners. So that is something which you have to take care. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Pramod uh, for your excellent talk on, and you have given us tips and tricks to how to do a radial angioplasty PCI. And this will help us, uh, especially our younger generations, to do more and more number of cases of radial angioplasty in Patna and Bihar. Thank you very much. The question and comments will be asked at the end of all talks. Now, 
I hand over the mic to the Dr. Shok Kumar. Thanks, sir. Uh, now I would like to invite our international speaker. He is well-known uh, personality uh, in the field of interventional cardiology globally, Dr. Shadur R. Khan from Bangladesh. And he will enlighten us uh, with the tips and tricks uh, following during bifurcation stenting. So, Dr. Shadur R. Khan, please. Am I audible now? Yeah, yeah, you are audible. Yeah, sir. Greetings, greetings from Dhaka, please. Uh, just uh, you have to, uh, the, the, my last speaker should unshare the screen so that I can share Pramod, my sir. screen. Pramod, sir, please do stop sharing your slides, sir. Pramod, sir. Pramod, Sangmitra. Oh, Sangmitra. <laughs> Sangmitra? Yeah, yeah. Yes, now. Okay. now you are visible, sir, and audible yep. too. Yeah, yep. It's audible and visible. Your slides are also visible. So I think it's visible. So greetings from Dhaka. Yes. And uh, really, I'm honored uh, to be here with you. Actually, I have uh, just, um, uh, I have a miss, uh, uh, I have just misunderstood that because the last topics, it has been written in my program list was left main bifurcations. So I didn't put the left main part specially in my talks, especially for the cases examples here. It was a radial intervention. I'm an absolute radialist. So I have got huge enjoyment hearing the lecture on transradial intervention since then. Now my topics is overview of bifurcation PCI tips and tricks. And uh, this is, you know, that these bifurcations are, uh, I have no interest. These sort of cages we usually do, but once upon a time, even two decades ago, the, with the metal lovers, the stent lovers used to call the bone cutter the surgeons while seeing a mouthwater inhalation even in the main branch, but involving a large side branch. And then at that time, we usually send them for surgery. And it was not a not small percentage. There was 50 to 20% of the cages. But nowadays, it is not like this. Like in European Bifurcation Club, I especially thanks since 2004, they have relentless effort for this sort of application. And now different Bifurcation Clubs from other countries also. And obviously, my lecture is not uh, my own my own cooking. It's based on the ABC consensus documents, white papers, and the 15th ABC consensus, and huge some few landmark trials like this. And these trials say, are uh, just provisional versus double stand techniques, or sometimes the the two stand techniques head to head trials like among these trials especially with the starting from the nordic and the definition old where the some of the trials has got some superiority with some techniques or provisionally superior to two stand techniques and the head to head trials with the other the, the, the techniques itself here also DK Crush 5 has been better so far, but EBC main, the latest trial has given us a glimpse of the culotte like BBK2 to go for elephant stenting with the culotte or the tap also. So what is bifurcation? The bifurcation lesion is basically a coronary artery narrowing and uh, occurring adjacent to and or involving the origin of the significant side brand. At least this definition has not been changed for last two decades. And this significant side branch means the branch which one doesn't want to lose. And that's the that's why I usually tell my fellows also, this is like uh, boils down to a three caspers. And these three components are like three caspers, the proximal main branch, distal main branch, and the side branch. And among these, the third one is the notchiest one to handle while we are talking about the bifurcation PCI. How we can classify the bifurcation? The bifurcation, say, you will say your head will spin because lots of classifications are there. But the sweetest one, by its nickname, the Medina, since 2005, is the sweetest and the easiest one to understand the bifurcation at a glance. And here, or not all the bifurcations are true. Some are true and some are non-true. And according to Medina, it's the triple one, zero one one, and one zero one. These three are the true bifurcation lesions. But if you go for the higher complex bifurcation lesions, by 
complex and true application relations, in that case, triple one and zero one one will be considered as the true complex bifurcation regions according to definition criteria. And here, there's the legend length as the takeoff angle and also the plaque composition, calcification and thrombos, thrombus. If it's there as, in a, as a minor criteria, then it will be very complex lesion with bifurcation lesions. And uh, the 15th EVC has pronounced the same determinants of the complexity along with the clinical settings, anatomical relevance, also the disease extent to the side branch and the plaque morphology and ease of access to the two branches. These determinants are very much important for procedural success. So now if we start with the SV relevance, the main determinant of the bifurcation PCI strategy to look, that is I can tell the third CASPA, there are controversies are there concerning the diameter of a significant side branch, whether it will be more than two. Earlier in COBIS-1, it was more than two millimeter, should be considered as a significant SV. COBIS-2, more than 2.3, then Nordic 2 definition 2, it has extended up to more than 2.5. The most important thing is it should be more than 73 millimeter on CT, which actually supplies at least 10% of the myocardial mass. And that's why that side branch is very much relevant and we have to handle it along with the main branch. So in a nutshell, how we treat a bifurcation, essentially it's a provisional or inverted provisional techniques. And, but in a definition too, when it is a complex bifurcation, then uh, in and around, and even in the EBC main also, 22.5% of the provisional required of crossing over to two stand strategy. And systematic two stand is the upfront one, which is a complex, uh, true bifurcation. In that case, we have to think of the two stem bifurcation but all the time for the payloads and for every we, and for us also. Always, we have to think that main branch should take priority over any sort of preeminence of the angiographic result in the side branch, we, which we will have to ensure it while treating the bifurcation. And to choose the appropriate strategy according to the bifurcation anatomy, the latest EVC maths family to be remembered also. This is the standard techniques with the AMADS, that main proximal first, main acrocyte first, double proximal side branch first. And here all the techniques are like the T, tap, culotte, or the, the step decay crush. These trials, this, this three especially, has got the much more importance uh, nowadays. And in bailout situation or in upfront to stand techniques, you can choose the A family from T, tap, or culotte, or S, decay crush family. And, it, and also you have to understand, or at least a numerical, uh, also we have to just name it in such a, properly when inverted techniques also very much important which especially in bailout situations so inverted techniques may be the inverted step decay crush or inverted tap or inverted culotte so in a nutshell if we do from the 15th abc papers is the if it is a double one zero or zero one zero or one zero one in that case you may you may end up with the provisional stenting or if it is a true bifurcation with triple one or zero one one, and where upfront two stent strategy is necessary, then this three techniques or the inverted three techniques can be possible here. And if it's a, a, this is that's I'm telling. And if if in a nutshell, if we talk about the left main bifurcation along with the non left main one, in general the bifurcation, then if left main a bit different from the non left main because of its own anatomic anatomic some peculiarities and some specialties also like 72 percent highly variable bifurcation angles and that's why in left main we have to treat a bit more meticulously and especially if it is 010 or 001 especially in left main or in non-left main also in that case the like in uh, 010 you know, where the osteal stenting might be considered in order to because these are the dilemma where the operators becomes a little bit that which way they will have to go like if the angle is favorable or perfect visualization of the sb takeoff and non-diseased left main or the non-left main whatever it is then we can go for the osteal stenting in case of 010 or 001 but not all the time but and followed by a cross sometimes when if we see that there is a, a extension of the disease there, especially in the left main, then we'll go for a crossover stenting, followed by pot and KBI, but not all the time because 
sometimes you can tell that like this case, you will see that we can go for a osteal stenting because but this 001 lesion subset in osteal LCS, also in non left main side branch, which is very much significant. In that case, we will have to think of the floating struts, and that's why which may lead to a fenestrated restenosis later on. And that's why the question of pot and KVI has come. But some rain group, uh, but some trials, they're also telling that no, not all the time, because the KVI is not all the time is necessary if SB is not compromised. Now, now in the bifurcation PCI, before going to the techniques that, that especially the three techniques or the technical details, we have to remember some key elements, some smaller but important details like three laws, especially this, these are very much complex, the Finner's law or Finner's formula is very much important where we, we, we have to remember these things or we have to keep it in your mind so that you can assess or at least assume that how much will be the diameters of the both side branch. And of course, in the, our mind, we have to keep this ESS or endothelial shear stress. That is the sound of the music of application. Because in, in, you know, then in low shear stress or low endothelial shear stress, which is in the lateral wall, that's got much <laughs> thrombus or thrombogenicity prone and also plaque prone and high ESS in the carinal level, usually less atherogenic. And of course, another term is the carina and the polygon of confluence, POC, which is very much important. It is the physiological carina should not be lost while doing the bifurcation PCA as much we can just preserve the neocarina, the metallic neocarina later on. That is very much important. And while doing the bifurcation, sometimes that this carina is shifting or plaque is shifting. So which one is to be a priority? That's also a big question sometimes because SB compromise is the issue here. After stenting, more carina shifting with narrower bifurcation angle by according to the cosine of the angle. And some studies said it's about 85% anatomic SB compromise. But that compromise is not always very much important because FFR subsequent FFR showed that this anatomical narrowing is not creating any functional problem at all. But in COVID-2 also, they have told that here in that case, also the plaque shift is much more important than finding of the carina shift. So here is a controversy still there, but we have to be able to keep both things in our mind. Then comes to the wearing. How many wares and types of wares we need? There are a lot, we can, we can just wear the both branches, not all the time. Because if we see that there's the length is and SB uh, is not diseased and also SB has a favorable angle in that case, uh, uh, is, uh, or is SB diseased, that's because we have to put the wear in the SB. If it's not, then you can only wear the main branch. And, but if the SB is very angulated, it's better to keep another wear. And what sort of wear we have to take? Any workers, workers wear is okay. And sometimes somebody, and somewhere there is controversies there, whether polymer coated or hydrophilic wear you can take as a jailed wear or, or somewhere you can use, no problem in that way also. This controversy is not there, even in the 15th EVC paper has also told these things. So crossing the hurdle of the rewiring, that is also one of the very important art in case of bifurcation PCI. So difficult SB access before stenting, in that case, pullback technique is one of the most important. I love it because in that case, uh, uh, you don't have any, any fear or any tense stress there, whether you have gone in between the strut or the wall. Or other than that, you may, if it is very much difficult, then you have to take the help of the microcatheter or the dual lumen catheter. Sometimes you have to change the wire. You have to take some specialty wire to rewire. Like in this case, it's a very difficult SD wiring and rewiring also. And uh, this rewiring also in which strut you will have to rewire. That is also an art for decay crush, proximal mid strut rewiring, and all other stand to stand strategies. The distal strut rewiring is okay. Pre shape both wires to complete these lesions. And also, again, one thing is that otherwise the whole procedures will have to start again from the beginning is the wire wrap. In ideally, most difficult and angulated lesions should be wired first and avoid excessive rotation of the second wire, keep the wire separate during PCI. It then comes to the ballooning because tons of modifiable balloon techniques are just, uh, just emerging in case of uh, bifurcation PCI. They're initiating from the pre-dilatation of the both MB and SB, not all the time, not 
not all the time because don't touch the SB if it's not if you think functionally that much important or significant then it's better not to predial it it if you need that it's it has got thrombosis thrombus or it has got calcifications from before upfront predilation is necessary and the most important one is the pot it's in in complex bifurcation lesion you know that pot and the bifurcation PCA is usually nowadays is made for each other. And why it is so important? Because it facilitates steering into the side brand, optimizes the final stand geometry and flow dynamics. How you'll do the pot should be performed before is been wearing, which you can see here, and use of short NCNSC balloons, distal shoulder of the balloon just proximal to the carina, proximal marker of the balloon inside the proximal stand aid, and the balloon size should be one is to one of the proximal MB. This spot is very much. Another legendary one is the kissing balloon inflation. This is also very much important if you don't need, want a bottleneck effect. And that's why how you'll do it. It is to be done after rewearing of the side branch through distal stand start, except in decay craft, balloon size to be chosen according to reference diameter or SBN distal diameter. And short and non-compliant balloons should be used. Sequential high pressure ballooning followed by a simultaneous kissing balloon inflation at moderate pressure followed by simultaneous deflation. This is now the best way to do the KBI. Side branch first, equal or 12 atmosphere, then a newer way that you will make it down to four atmosphere. That is the modifiable modified KBI. Minimal overlapping of the two balloons is very much important and longer inflation at least 20 to 30 seconds is very much important. There are also some other balloonings like port side port, which is also getting popular in this part of the hemisphere, especially in South Asia and uh, where you don't need two balloons to take. So where you don't need a larger catheter or there is gel balloon technique. This is also the, the Saito has got some special interest for this gel balloon techniques to, to keep the side branch open and this is the modified gel balloon techniques you can use with the, taking a keeping a smaller balloon there before MB stanting. And vascular access, what, what the, my previous speaker has already told that everything is possible by the transradial approach and six French guide catheter or the virtual six French guide catheter, which is uh, can be available very soon in our country also, the shitless guide catheter or the six French, then it's everything is possible here. So now let's talk about the cases. Let's talk about the cases here. In this case, is that this is a provisional stenting, and here we see that this this is a Medina one one zero, and here we have made the main branch stenting jailing aware, and then we have made a pod and the and the process, and and you see that SB is not compromised, and this is the simplest way to do a bifurcation in a provisional approach where the side branch is not important. If it's say it's like this one is a CTO LED, but uh, and here it's of the business 010, and then jailed where we have put a you know huge large large uh, side branch or diagonal. The IVAS has been done, the disease has not been extended that much in the side branch. Then main branch stenting was done, and after that uh, we have done a dot that means distal optimization that is very much important. Then we have put FFR wear because it's a huge side branch there because there was some some uh, some scarina shift was there and then FFR is 0.95. Final IV is also telling there is no problem there, so the the procedure has been ended with a reasonable result. If it is a tap technique, in that case it's like a provisional one, and then later on we'll put uh, the SB stand after balloon position positioning and then SB stenting will should be done and then post dilation and kissing balloon inflation and the repeat pot. So a tap technique usually has one rewiring, two pot and one kiss. And this is one of the examples that's the, how you can do a tap. This is a systematic two stand strategy we have taken here. Difficult SB wearing was there. So we have to take a filter it's still wear. Then we have done MB stenting here. Then the first pot was done. And after that, we have reworked it with uh, a, a little bit knuckling, and then SB stenting was done, then kissing balloon inflation, and then second part, and this is the final result. So by this way, the cap is a little bit simpler procedure to techniques to do that one. And if it is cool out, then it's a little bit, you know, 
that a little bit complex. It means two rewiring, two part, and one kiss. And this is one of the examples of the cool of, of the. It's in geography, it didn't look that much significant. It's a triple one, and Ivas has shown that it's huge of black burden are there inside. So we have gone for MB to SB inverted cooler techniques here, and it's the first part done, first rewiring done, then the MB to distal MB stenting was done. Then, kiss, then the second rewiring was done, then the kissing balloon inflation, and then the second part, and then we have done the IVAS, and this is the final result. So by this way, that it looks pretty beautiful. If we go for the decay crush, which is a sensational techniques now, it looks, it, it's a bit complex, but it's very beautiful to go, especially for the left main, complex left main uh, bifurcation two stand strategy, just two rewiring, two part and two keys we need here. Decay crash and first rewiring should be non-distal rewiring and the second one should be distal rewiring. So this is one of the case that where we have done a non-left main case, where we have done a decay crash here with all these steps we have followed here, uh, along with the IVAS imaging and the all the steps has been done. And then the we have done the second rewiring, first part, and then second rewiring, and then also the second KBI, second part, and the post IVS has also been done, and this is the final picture is like this. So these are all the technical details, but the new one, which has been the Dr. Shubanon has told, as has, been, has been established in, in, in the world, is the nano crush, a little bit simpler than the decay crush, where a little bit some procedural simplifications are there where one rewriting two part and two keys and you can finish the procedure like this one here we have done all this this stent positioning keeping the balloon in the mb at karina and then sp stenting was done crushed followed by kbi then mb stenting was done then first part was done and then rewriting through the middle strap and then we have done the post ivis and the second kbi second part and then the final result is pretty acceptable. And also uh, during this, all these steps of techniques and after that, in, in, in all these techniques, you, you can see that imaging has a great role and we can play here, especially the IVAS and OCTs, both you can use here. And there is no, because there are some limitations to the angiography evaluations, especially for the left main bifurcation, imaging is a part and parcel. And uh, this also should be kept in our mind. So this way, to wrap up, we can tell that bifurcation PCA is not that much complex if the internal physics are known better because there are some mathematics and physics here that we have to remember that one. Choice of technique is not like love me, love me not like this one. It should be kept according to the merits of the bifurcations and uh, sorry, and, uh, and also to, I think I have lost the slide. And sorry, I have some technical difficulties here. And uh, also this is, uh, and the main hiccup here is sometimes the handling of this uh, side branch stand, which can be solved by port and KBI. Steps are to be memorized as there is no way to go back again. Obviously provisional single stand strategy is better. Current and neo current architecture are to be perfect like an art. So these and the stand enhancing tools like IVAS or OCTs are helpful in these situations. That's all I can tell about bifurcations. Thanks uh, for this in the midst of this uh, COVID era that I think uh, like this uh, two is still maintaining the distancing, but maybe one day they will come closer like us also. Thanks for patience hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Thanks for your uh, nice deliberation and uh, tips and tricks. We have learned a lot of things in doing bifurcation stenting. Now, I would like to invite our uh, last speaker of this session from USA, Dr. Anjan Sinha, and he will enlighten us about mitral valve disease 2021 updates. So, Dr. Anjan Sinha, sir, please. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. Let's share uh, my slides. Your slide is not visible, sir, yet.
please unmute sir can you can yeah, you can yeah. you see the slides yeah yeah your slide is visible now and quite audible also okay yeah sir all right so before uh, we start um, well thanks for your invitation and uh, hopefully in the next 15 to 20 minutes we can walk you through how we approach the mitral valve disease in uh, 2021 and hopefully onwards uh, i have nothing to disclose regarding this talk uh, let's uh, start with the uh, three patients. Uh, this is the first uh, patient with 48 year old lady. She's uh, entirely asymptomatic. She runs a uh, marathon. She's got no medical problems. Uh, she had a heart murmur, which uh, prompted an echocardiogram. And uh, uh, this is an echocardiogram. Can you see the echocardiogram playing? Uh, yes, we can see. Yeah. As, and as you can see that, you know, there's a fairly significant uh, posterior leaflet prolapse, uh, significant mitral regurgitation. Uh, she undergoes uh, cardiocatheterization. You see that she's very well compensated. Her wedge pressure average is 12 with a V wave, which is expected. Her uh, systolic and diastolic dimensions are slightly abnormal, but nothing uh, terribly abnormal. Ejection fraction is maintained. So that is the patient number one. She's entirely asymptomatic. This is our patient number two. This is a 50 year old gentleman who has multiple heart failure hospitalizations. He's a retired football player. And uh, this is his echocardiogram. Uh, as you do see that he's got a very significant left ventricle to systolic dysfunction. Uh, He's got a significant mitral regurgitation and diastolic dimensions are elevated, systolic dimensions are elevated and ejection fraction is 29%. And uh, this is the left atrial pressure. The mean left atrial pressure is 37. So very decompensated, which is not unexpected knowing the clinical history of this patient. Uh, and the third patient is uh, somewhat similar, 75 year old, a little bit older, who has previous coronary artery bypass surgery. He has recurrent heart failure and uh, echocardiogram uh, shows a, a massive left atrium. Uh, same thing, the ejection fraction is reduced uh, and severe mitral regurgitation is noted. The mean left atrial pressure is 31 here with the V waves approaching 52. So, so let's just stop with these three patients and let's uh, you know, tease these apart a little bit. Uh, before we get into that, what is the right strategy for each of those, uh, let's summarize how we approach these patients. And you, know, you can classify much regurgitation in many ways and anatomically, but uh, the most important classification which we have learned uh, is useful is carpenter classification, which is what is the leaflet motion. And uh, we broadly classify them into type one, two, and three. Three is further divided into A and B. And it's primarily around the leaflet motion. So somebody with Normal leaflet motion, if you have annular dilatation or leaflet perforation, they are type one, um, the most commonly seen in patients with chronic atrial fibrillation. Type two is the leaflet prolapse, which is our first patient, which I showed you, uh, where the leaflets move excessively. And that type three, which is where the leaflets move too little, they are very restricted, and which is our patient number two and patient number three. Uh, and these have implications how we treat them. Uh, in a generalized approach could be that if you can find mitral regurgitation, you fix the mitral regurgitation, but that is too simplistic and it's probably not the way we approach. Uh, we all agree on one thing, that if you do find significant severe valvular stenosis or regurgitation and they're symptomatic, then you operate them. We also have general disagreement that if somebody is entirely asymptomatic, then we should not operate them. However, both of these uh, statements uh, you know, have uh, controversies and, and we'll go through some of that. So what is, a, what is the argument about you know, the statement uh, number two is it is extremely hard to make anybody you know, feel better if they're entirely asymptomatic, particularly the patient which are demonstrated, somebody who runs marathon. Uh, and it also comes with a price tag now, if you could actually repair the valve, then that could be a diff different ballgame. But if you could not repair the valve, uh, then mitral valve replacement at any age, you know, they all have a different uh, risks. There are some upfront risks and there are some down the line risks, but even take about five to 8% risk, which is, includes morbidity and mortality. 
And, but there's an ongoing problem, you know, mechanical valves and bioprocessory valve, they all have one package going forward. Uh, so obviously, you know, we have traded one disease for another and, and the person hasn't felt better. Uh, so it is our conventional old dictum that either we wait for the symptoms or we wait for left ventricular systolic dysfunction. Now, the controversy is that how do we define LV systolic dysfunction? Is it by ejection fraction, by LV dilatation, LV systolic dimensions, and, or something else? And, and that's, you know, that is something which we'll talk about a little bit today. This is a particularly important in a mitral regurgitation because the ejection fraction and the volume, they are both misleading. Ejection fraction in the mitral regurgitation is elevated simply because mitral regurg is a low pressure valve where the left ventricle can empty a lot easier and that all changes after the valve replacement. So the timing of the surgery, we realized that by the time these patients develop symptoms, maybe the left ventricle systolic dysfunction, which was a lot more profound than we had initially appreciated. So this is known in the surgical world that the patients who have either no symptoms or have functional class one or two symptoms, if you operate them, you know, they do quite well. They do their life expectancy as good as the patients without valvular disease. Uh, whereas if the patients have developed symptoms and even if you operate them, uh, their long-term outcomes are not exactly the same. Uh, so that brings up to the point is that should we be operating some of these patients uh, slightly early? And, and that could be the case. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, other slide which actually demonstrates the same that if you wait for ejection fraction to drop, then you generally are not going to get the same long term results in these people. Um, so, a general rule is that if you do wait for LV systolic dysfunction, then you, know, you generally have not helped these patients which in the best manner you could have. Um, but the question is that is everybody with preserved LV function in systolic dimension or diastolic dimension? is the right candidate for surgery. And this is something which we have been you know, arguing, and this is still a controversial topic, but a general rule is, you know, if we do not induce the morbidity and mortality, which I stated to you before, which is 5%, then it is reasonable to operate severe regurgitation as long as you can do the surgery with a very high success rate, it's a repairable valve, and you have very high level of surgical expertise. It turns out is that is quite limited to a very small group of those patients which have prolapse and restricted prolapses. So taking that into account, American College of Cardiology guidelines have incorporated that. And the bullet point is, if you can actually repair the valve with nearly 95% success and mortality of less than 1%, then it is reasonable to operate these people who are asymptomatic, do not have LV dimension, increased and have preserved left ventricular systolic function. Now, sometimes that could not be comfortably predicted whether you're gonna have 95 plus percent success rate with surgical repair. And such was in my patient where my surgeon told me that, well, you know, there's a, there's a good possibility that surgery could be done without replacement, but there's no guarantees. Uh, so what do we do for these patients? So do we look for any other surrogate markers and you know, if I send this patient to surgery, got a mechanical valve, then we were into this box, which is slightly higher than I would like to accept for somebody who has absolutely no symptoms and does not have LV systolic dysfunction. So to answer this question, this, you know, the Ann Arbor group years ago did this trial. They took these patients, similar patients to the cath lab. They classified these patients into three groups. And, and our interest will be today, will be group one and two, where both of these groups have the patients who are asymptomatic. They have a compensated, they have compensated left ventricular cavity. They have ejection fraction, they're normal. But the only difference is their myocardial contractility, which is measured by DPDT. A group one has preserved DPDT versus group two has reduced DPDT. Group three is the decompensated patient and that person obviously gets benefit. I mean, that's across the board. So if you actually follow these patients post-surgery, you realize that the group one patients really actually didn't benefit much. They're, this is the change in their end diastolic volumes. This is their end systolic volume changes post-operatively. There's very little difference, if any, 
really the group which benefited really was group two, where even though from outside, everything looked identical, but these are the patients who have reduced myocardial contractility as basically measured by DPDT, which was done in the cath lab. Now it is very cumbersome to do all of that in the cath lab. So easier surrogate of that will be to do that with you know, myocardial strain imaging. And this is a nice paper, which was published from Cleveland Clinic from Melinda Size Group, where they demonstrated that the patients have LV strain, which is you know, less than minus 18, they have very significant increase event rate if they were not operated. And in fact, just exercise alone failed to predict that same outcomes. So we realized that you know, incorporating left ventricular strain, which is detecting subclinical myocardial dysfunction may be an additional tool for some of these patients for further risk of stratification. So if you actually have to rewrite the guideline, this is what you expect in the next future guidelines in with the patients who have you know, preserved left ventricular systolic function in LV dimensions, which are not dilated. And if there's evidence of left ventricular dysfunction by strain imaging, these are the patients who would be suitable candidate for surgical intervention early on. The patients, in the other hand, who have preserved left ventricular systolic function and had normal strain imaging, those are the patients who are better off waiting. So let's come back to our case number two, which is non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, and the case number three, which is also ischemic cardiomyopathy with severe mitral regurgitation. Both of these patients have in common that they have leaflet restriction, they have LV systolic dysfunction, and, and these patients are sick people. They have recurrent hospitalizations, and we have long known that these patients do not do well. As you do see that the patients with you know, severe mitral regurgitation in the setting of systolic dysfunction, their outcomes are very, very, very poor. However, we have not been able to reverse that course. And this is a, in a Steve Bowling's paper, which has failed to demonstrate that the surgery actually has not had any benefit of correcting those mitral regurgitations. And there are many other papers like that. Uh, so one thing which we have learned that even though severe mitral regurgitation in the setting of LV systolic dysfunction is a bad disease, but we have not been able to alter that natural history even by a surgical intervention. But this is a paper from Mark Gillino, which demonstrates that the part of the reason could be that we are actually not doing good surgery. We are doing repairs, and a lot of these repairs are not working. A lot of the failure, long-term failure rate of these repairs is what's probably costing the problem. Right. There is upfront risk of doing replacement so there is no uniform consensus today whether you, know, you should actually repair these patients or you should replace these patients. But the surgical literature has failed to demonstrate any benefit of actually fixing a severe mitral regurgitation in the setting of severe LV systolic dysfunction and functional mitral regurgitation. So then the point is, since both of these patients have been non-surgical, then what are the alternative options? And do we have alternative options? And this question has been in part answered by two major trials. One is a European trial, this is mitral FR trial, in which demonstrated no benefit of mitral valve intervention, which is done by mitral clip, versus COAP trial, which is American trial, predominantly American trial, where there's a clear difference in death and hospitalization in in fact, number needed to treat even for the death is less than five patients. So this is a very positive trial. Now the same therapy, similar patients, in fact, actually the patients are not entirely similar, but uh, they are at least conceptually similar patients. So why there is a, such a big difference between these two groups? So what we could conclude that the mitral valve repair done by the percutaneous technique could be a viable option as long as we realize that who the right patients are, because we have clearly failed to demonstrate any benefit in the mitral FR trial, much like a surgical, whereas there's very, very appreciable, very, very sound benefit in the COAP trial. So there's got to be something more than what we know, need to know. And particularly, this becomes even more important because there are because there are newer techniques which are coming out in the process where you can trick care for the sicker people. Now, this is, the, this is a trial currently on hold, uh, 
but this is a cardio band, which is an annular reduction technology. Uh, and as you could see that this could be done percutaneously and there's early feasibility work has been done, but uh, because of technical reasons, the trial is currently not enrolling anybody. These anchors are placed uh, into the annulus and which is uh, confirmed uh, fluoroscopically as well as by uh, transesophageal echocardiogram. And then these are tightened. And um, this is uh, results in a significant reduction of uh, mitral regurgitation. And quite similar concept, which is actually a little bit more in the process is uh, this millipede, which uh, already had the pilot work done and the early feasibility work done and the clinical trial has just started is to actually put the anchors into the mitral annulus and then with a three-dimensional intracardiac echo uh, you actually shrink those annulus uh, and and reduce the mitral regurgitation significantly now fortunately both of these techniques which are annular reduction techniques uh, leave you the option to actually do uh, leaflet uh, treatment such as a uh, you know, the mitral clip or even a future transcatheter mitral valve replacement. Um, so with that, since we can treat a lot of these patients a lot more safely, now it comes to that, you know, do we know, do we realize that who are these right patients who we should be offering this? Uh, you know, in the process of our own patients, uh, we looked at very carefully, you know, not uh, just the left ventricle, obviously in the patient two and patient three, which we demonstrated to you, they both actually had similar ejection fraction, but what we appreciated that you know the importance of right ventricle is probably more than anything else that we have ever appreciated in the past. And this is the work done uh, from our group uh, where we divided these patients with a different type of right ventricular strain and we have done a global RV strain, uh, divided these patients into group one, two, and three. And as you could do, see that five-year outcome their survival is so much appreciably different. And these are the patients who have similar left ventricular impairments. So, so I think, you know, taking this into account, I think our job is to identify who those patients will be uh, by adding additional tools, such as this right ventricular strain. Um, so going back to our patients, our first patient underwent uh, mitral valve repair and uh, had a good surgical result. And interestingly, and if you actually look at the tissue Doppler signals, um, this was a post-operative tissue Doppler signal. And there's a very appreciable diastolic dysfunction in this patient, which wasn't appreciated actually. So it turns out is that she had a subclinical LV dysfunction, which was unmasked after the surgery was contemplated. And in fact, actually she had initial decline in LV systolic function as which is expected in a lot of those patients. Uh, our patient number two, who was a younger gentleman under a mitral clip procedure, and, and this was uh, the final result, he continued to decompensate and uh, died after 14 months. Um, he had recurrent hospitalization, so his, his course was not uh, favorably altered. Uh, and it turns out is that he had a very poor right ventricular dysfunction. Uh, this was our patient three, who was an uh, you know, elderly gentleman, 75-year-old, whose ejection fraction was somewhat lower, who also underwent mitral clip procedure with a very good result. And he did not have any hospitalizations uh, in 13 months. And then he moved to Florida and we don't have follow-up after that. Uh, but he lived independently with uh, no limitations in his activity. And so on paper, this person looked sicker by every means compared to the younger person. But this person's right ventricular function, as you can appreciate a little bit here, was a lot better than the other person's was. So in summary, our approach is the following. Every time we deal with significant mitral stenosis or regurgitation, predominantly regurgitation, we classify into three Cs, which is, is the valve cause for the problem? Is the valve causing the symptoms? Is the valve causing LV systolic dysfunction? And, and when we basically say LV systolic dysfunction, <laughs> We go to the strain imaging as well. And 
if there is symptomatic and if they have high repair success, if they do not have high repair success, then do they have abnormal strain imaging? And if so, do they have options for surgery or transcatheter? Second, is the mitral valve happens to be comorbidity? That is not what caused the LV systolic dysfunction, but it is big enough problem today, in addition to the primary problem, they have ischemic heart disease, and on top of that, severe mitral regurgitation is complicating that. And these are the patients by, after further risk of stratification, including the use of right ventricular strain, they should be either offered surgery or transcatheter intervention if suitable. And the third group is coexistence where the mitral regurgitation happens to be present with the primary disease, but was truly not the cause for the decompensation nor created the decompensation in the first place. These are the patients where we got to treat the primary disease. These are the patients which are more like in a mitral heart transplantation. And I think with that, I will stop. I will take any questions. Thanks a lot, sir. Very nice presentation. And one question from Dr. Shaidus. One question from Dr. Shaidus, sir. Mm -hmm. Sir, we are audible, sir? Yes, yes. I'm audible. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, in a case of uh, bifurcation lesion involving left main coronary artery, having mm -hmm. Medina classification 110, after putting the stent from left main to LED and after pot, if there is 30 to 40% plaque shift into the sarc, is it necessary to do a kissing balloon finally? Or just leave it if flow is yeah. Uh, limited. <clears throat> yeah, it's a it's a it's a million dollar question, you know, because this question is you now roaming about in the whole whole intervention community, especially those with the uh, bifurcation club people, especially the Imatship and the, uh, the one of the uh, the head person of the European bifurcation club. He has a recent most trial. It's the Rain uh, Cardio Group. Uh, the like registry-like trial, not a randomized study, but he has shown shown that the KBI, that means kissing balloon inflation in, in the side branch, which you are not going to stand, and a minimal plaque shift is there, but TV3 flow is there, whether it is necessary or not. The question has been uh, just arose, arisen here because of these things that you see huge artery and you have a floating strut there. And that's why the KBI but just opened the strut. There should not be any jail strut. There is a question of fenestrated restenosis. So which one is important? Whether you will touch by KBI, the untouched side branch, which you don't need to touch, or you will just open the strut a little bit. So that's the big question. Still, the controversy is there. If, if uh, according to me, still, I believe in that, not to manipulate that much until and unless the Timitri flow is established or Timitri flow is there. So it's better not to go. Only the pot is the final thing to do, not the KBI. Not Thank the you, sir. Thank you. Any question from the audience? Yeah. Or the chairpersons? If not, then we are finishing this session. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you very much. Manmohan, do you want to ask some question? Dr. Manmohan? Dr. Manmohan, sir, please unmute. Dr. Dilip, sir, do you want to make any comments? Yeah, yeah. You are, think, expert, uh, you are the expert intervention cardiologist. You are the... Huh? Excellent. <laughs> so you please ask questions to other speakers or make some your own comment and your own experience. You can share. Dr. Dilip, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, it was a very nice like uh, set of lectures. And uh, uh, I would like to highlight one or two points in bifurcation stenting. Like EBC main trial, which we really uh, we were waiting for this trial for so long, but it has given us more questions than answers. So number one, the decay crush was only in 5% cases. And what a very re relevant question uh, which was raised that uh, whether a 30% plaque shift needs a kissing, kissing balloon inflation or not. And it's EBC trial, they have uh, done a kissing balloon inflation in most of the cases in professional stenting. So they have, bought, uh, they have you know, raised many questions than answers. Uh, first of all, you see the GK crush 5 trial and the definition trial, they recruited most sick patients and complex patients with a, a kind of a, a syntax score of 29. 
and in EBC main trial, it was syntax score of mean of 21. So these were less sick patients, less complex patients. And when we have a side branch of a magnitude of circumflex, so left main doesn't have a side branch. They both are rather treated should be as a main branch. And if you have a side like a circumflex disease, which is more severe, which is more than 10 millimeter, you can't go for a provisional stenting. You have to go for a two stent strategy. So I don't know what is the future fate of uh, you know the trend of the intervention in left main, but I still feel DK crash is the winner when you have a very sick and very disease side branch, large side branch. Go with the protection of side branch first. Go with a single stent there and then crush it. And go with the you know uh, kind uh, of. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I want to I want to add here. I want to add here a little bit, Dr. Dilip, that this that uh, this EBC main I have got uh, in a conference uh, just uh, the Miroslav, principal investigator of the EBC main. So we have been in. Uh, I have I have that question also to him that why you have done the uh, kissing balloon inflation in a provisional strategy, single stand strategy in all of the cases and. Ultimately, you know, you know that all the the twenty two percent provisional single stent strategy patients has been converted into a two stent strategy, bailout two stent strategy they needed in twenty two percent cases, and these twenty two percent most of them has got this kissing balloon inflation in the provisional single stent strategy. So when they have done this. By doing the kissing balloon inflation, they have created the side branch a much more that, that you need a second stand there. So it has turned into a bailout second stand strategy. So I am not in favor of kissing balloon inflation in uh, where the side branch is. Located.